a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Jack Benny program transcribed, presented by Lucky Strike. Let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. Yes, let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. And that's because L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, fine, light, naturally mild tobacco that gives you smoothness and mildness. And no wonder, for years, Lucky Strike has maintained America's largest and most complete cigarette research laboratory. Prior to the auctions, the buyers for Lucky Strike send sample leaves from all tobacco growing areas to this great laboratory for scientific analysis to help determine which tobaccos are really fine. And this is only one phase of the constant research that helps make possible Lucky Strike's unconditional guarantee. Check the cigarette you are now smoking. Among all leading brands, only the makers of Lucky Strike put an unconditional guarantee on the pack. So smoke a Lucky. Let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. Make your next carton Lucky Strike. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. and gentlemen, last night, Jack Benny was in Washington, D.C., where he was master of ceremonies for the annual White House Photographer's Ball. Immediately following the affair, he boarded a plane and flew back to Hollywood. And here he is, Jack Benny! Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, isn't it amazing how you can travel nowadays? Late last night, I was in Washington, D.C., and at 8 o'clock this morning, I was back in Hollywood. Yes, Jack, the planes they have today really move fast. They certainly do. It only took nine hours. But it's a good thing we got in when we did. I was so hungry, I couldn't wait till I got home and had breakfast. Well, Jack, why didn't you eat on the way in? They serve meals on the plane. Yes, I know, I know. And there's no charge for them. I was so... What? Don. That's right, Jack. That's right. The meals don't cost you anything. It's included in your ticket. How do you like that? <laughs> Jack, where are you going? To the TWA ticket office. Somebody's going to take me to dinner. <laughs> I don't care who it is, but somebody has got to... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. How was your flight back from Washington? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. Was it a nice, smooth trip? Mm, fairly smooth, Mary. Not bad at all. You didn't get sick, did you? No, no, although I did feel a little woozy, you know, going over the mountains. Well, maybe you overate. <laughs> overate? Mary, I just found out. <laughs> Don told me. Told you what? Never mind, I'll explain it later. Well, Jack, tell us, how was the affair in Washington? I'll bet it was pretty classy, huh? Classy? Don, you've never seen anything like it. The people I met, it was positively thrilling. Who was there, Jack? Who was there? President Truman, Vice President Barkley, General Eisenhower, General Bradley, Secretary of the Treasury, Snyder, everybody. Ah, Jack, that must have been wonderful. How did you feel when you met President Truman? President Truman? Well, I didn't get to meet the president. You see, on my way over to shake hands with him, I came face to face with Vice President Barkley. Oh, then you met the vice president. Well, no. (laughs) Jack.
Just as I was about to say hello to the vice president, General Eisenhower came in, so naturally Mr. Barkley went over to greet him. And kids, what a guy that Eisenhower is. What a personality. And so democratic. He shook hands with everybody. Well, Jack, I certainly envy you. Years from now, you'll be able to say, I shook hands with General Eisenhower. Well... (laughs) You see, Don... When General Eisenhower and Vice President Barkley were talking, I was going over to shake hands with him when in walked Dean Acheson. And naturally, I couldn't ignore the Secretary of State. He's really an impressive man. He makes everybody feel so relaxed, you know, so at home. Well, I'm glad you got to meet Mr. Acheson. Huh? You did meet (laughs) Dean Acheson, didn't you? Well, (laughs) when Mr. Acheson walked in, I rushed over to him and stuck out my hand. What did he do? He handed me his coat, so I hung it up. (laughs) You know, it was an awkward situation. Well, Jack, when Mr. Atchison handed you his coat, uh, why didn't you tell him who you were? Well, I didn't want to embarrass him. You didn't want to return the tip, either. (laughs) Yeah. Eisenhower gave me nothing. Anyway, it was a very exciting affair, and I was certainly glad to be there. Jack, do you mean to say that with all the important people who were there, you didn't get to meet anybody? Didn't get to meet anybody for your information, sister. I spent most of the evening talking to David Quimby. Uh, David Quimby? Who's he? Well, if you don't know who David Quimby is, I'm not going to tell you. You ought to keep up on your national affairs, kid. Who else was there, Jack? Well, there was Air Secretary Symington, Senator Taft, Dr. Gallup, and... Oh, I must tell you a funny thing, Don. Last night after the dinner, Dr. Gallup was the first speaker, and he kept calling the president Tom. He just can't get over it. (laughs) It's too bad you... Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. I was just telling Don and Mary about Washington. Washington? Yes, I was the master of ceremonies at the White House Photographer's Ball. You horn in on everything, don't you? (laughs) I didn't horn in at all. I was invited. You know who else was there? Who? President Truman, Vice President Barkley, General Eisenhower. Gosh, Mr. Benny, you're really important, aren't you? Yes, sir, I guess I am. Oh, don't be so modest. I'll bet you could go out now and get your own show. Dennis, Dennis, I'd like to ask you a question. Okay, sit down, kid. I don't have to sit down. I just want to ask you one question. Who's the star of this show? My mother thinks I am. Well, this is getting me nowhere. So come on, star, let's have your song. Okay. Wait a minute. Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. I'm Jack Benny. Here you are. Thank you. Hey, boy, boy. Yeah? Uh, you didn't wait for me to give you a tip. The last time I waited, the office sent out a St. Bernard. <laughs> what? Before I got back to Brandy, he was 20 years old. <laughs> Never mind. Goodbye. Jack, what? you dropped the telegram, so I opened it. It's from Washington. From Washington? What does it say? Uh, dear Jack, I'm sorry I didn't get to talk to you longer, but I had three people waiting for a haircut. Signed, David Quimby. <laughs> Hmm. Who's he? Never mind. Sing your song. Mary, stop staring at me. I begin to say good night, and then I heard my child. Not one ribbon 
Scarlet Ribbon, sung by Dinah Shore. And, uh... <laughs> very good, Fanny. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Now, ladies and gentlemen, for our featured attraction tonight, we're going to do a very important sketch. Dennis, you're going to be in it. You too, Mary. And Phil... Phil! Just a minute, Quimby. I'm fixing up the music for the sketch you're going to do. <laughs> you what? You heard me. I'm fixing up the music. Right now, I'm going over the trombone player's part. You... You're going over the trombone player's part? You don't know one note from another. Who has to know notes? What? I'm going over it with a damp rag. He spilled beer on it. <laughs> well, that you can do, yeah. Bill, why don't you get rid of these fellas? Get yourself another band. Get rid of my boys? Frankie, Charlie, Cornelius? <laughs> Cornelius? Well, not on your life, Jackson. These boys have stuck to me through thick and thin. The rough going, the one-night stands, the lean years. Well, Phil, that reminds me of something I've always wanted to ask you. Why did you form an orchestra in the first place? I had to, Dad. (laughs) (laughs) You had to? I had to. I wrote a little gem called That's What I Like About the South, and no other band would touch it with a fork. With a fork isn't in here at all, you know. He has. <laughs> well, in this case, necessity was the mother of nausea. <laughs> but seriously, Bill, do you mean that all of your boys have been with you right from the start? Yes, sir, Jackson, and that's why I wish you'd quit picking on them. They're conscientious musicians. They worry a lot. <laughs> worry? Sure. Now, take my drummer, Sammy, up there. Only three months ago, he had a full head of hair. <laughs> Only three months ago, and he's that bald now? Phil, what was he so worried about? They said something nasty about him in Downbeat. (laughs) Oh, well, that's a shame. You know, Phil, it's bad enough to be that bald, but why does he wax it? (laughs) Anyway, Phil, we have a very important... We have a very important sketch to do tonight, and you're in it. You, Dennis, and Mary. Mary, will you hand me the script? They're under the table. Sure, Jack. Here you are. Thanks. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we really have a surprise for you. For our feature attraction tonight, we're going to do our version of that thrilling radio mystery series, The Whistler. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who are you? I am the Whistler. I walk by night. I influence the lives of innocent people. 
And sometimes I even drive them to murder. Well, I'm certainly glad you dropped in because tonight you can help me with the uh, sketch we're going to do. Jack? Jack, who are you talking to? That man, that man right there. What man? I don't see anybody. That man right there who was whistling. Whistling? I didn't hear anybody, Jack. Are you kids crazy? I'm telling you, there was a man standing right there. Dennis, you saw him, didn't you? Yeah, he was a kind of a mysterious-looking fellow with a brown suit and a scowl on his face. That's right, that's right. And what was he whistling? Dear hearts and gentle people. <laughs> he was not! It was the Whistler's theme song. Jack, what's the matter with you? You didn't see anybody and neither did Dennis. Well, I thought I did. Maybe it's because I got my mind all wrapped up in the play we're going to do. Now, Mary... In... Oh, who can that be? Hello? Hello, boss. This is Rochester. Rochester, how many times have I told you not to call me in the middle of a program? But, boss, I had to call you. I got something I think you'll like. What's that? Well, you won't believe this, but this afternoon I sat down and wrote a commercial. You wrote a commercial? Yes, boss, and I liked it so much I got out your recording machine and made a record of it. No kidding. Well, let's hear it. Okay, just a minute. Listen to this. Grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worries on the doorstep. Just direct your feet to the luggage side of the street. Mine's an LSMFT, and you'll never have a rumble. Life can be so sweet on the luggage side of the street. Just let your taste tell you why. Lucky strike you should buy, and you'll save me, oh my. What smoothness and mildness, yes, it's L-S-M-F-T. Lucky strike means find a back door. Just direct your feet to the sunny side of the street. Yes, it's Ellis, M.F.T. Love you strike me, find the bag over. Just direct your feet to the lucky. I said the lucky. I mean the lucky side of the street. Rochester, that was wonderful. I thought you'd like it. I sure did. Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. Gee, fellas, I wish you could have heard the wonderful commercial Rochester sang to me over the phone. Can we use it on the program sometime? Sure, it's great. Now, where were we? You're getting ready to do that play, Jackson. Oh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we now offer you our version of that blood-curdling, thrilling radio murder mystery, The Whistler. Gwendolyn, this is a wonderful breakfast. I'm sure glad I'm married to you. So am I, Griffith. Where are the children? We have no children. <laughs> oh, 
Then who is it that's always bringing me my slippers? Our Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> oh, it's a bunny I've wasted to have his teeth straightened. <laughs> Griffith, I have a surprise for you. My mother's coming to live with us. Oh, bully, that's wonderful. <laughs> See, they're happy. But I'll change that. Gwendolyn, when is your dear darling mother coming? Tomorrow. Oh, I'm glad you told me in time. Now I can buy her a present. I wonder what I should give her. Why don't you give her a hit on the head? <laughs> no, Gwen, your father gave her that last year. Uh, what did you say, dear? I just answered your question. But I didn't say anything. Oh, I thought you did. You see, I have them confused already. <laughs> well, I better finish my breakfast. Yes, here's a great big bowl of cereal. Wait, I'll pour the cream on it for you. You can take your fingers out of your ears now. They stop crackling. <laughs> now, eat your cereal. Gee, that was a stubborn little one, wasn't it? <laughs> it, it certainly was, darling. Darling, darling, come on, come on, slugger with something. I've got other homes to break up. Uh, what did you say, Griffith? Oh, I didn't say anything. My mouth was full of the breakfast of champions. <laughs> well, I better finish my breakfast and hurry to the office. Yes, Griffith. Hurry to your office. While your wife, Gwen, waits at home for her sweetheart, the milkman. She, she adores him. <laughs> Coming up the walk now. Won't you come with me to Alabama? Let's go see my dear old mammy. And, and song drives me nuts. All right, knock on the door. She's waiting for you. Hello, baby. Hello, Clyde. I've been waiting for you. <laughs> Wait a minute, i got to get rid of this milk. Why don't you drink it? Who, me? <laughs> Go ahead, Clyde, drink it. It'll be good for that pool table complexion. <laughs> With those side pockets under your eyes. Come here, baby, pucker up. Give me a kiss. Why, sure, Clyde. Lay one on. <laughs> really thrilled you, eh, baby? No, you're holding that cold milk bottle on my back. <laughs> oh, Clyde, you're so wonderful. Kiss me again. You see? She's crazy about Clyde. Everybody's crazy about Clyde. But I'm the one they invited to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Glenn... I wonder what your husband would say if he caught you kissing me, his best friend. Oh, I'd tell him you're congratulating me on my birthday. But you've told him that 28 times this year. <laughs> Ain't he getting wise? No, but he's getting mad buying me all those presents. <laughs> Gee, Clyde, you and I could be so happy together if it weren't for my husband. Oh, now you're on the right track. Well, go ahead. Why don't you kill your husband? Clyde. I just got an idea. So did I. Let's kill Griffith. <laughs> it must be love. We set it together. That's it. That's it. Now we're getting somewhere. Go ahead. Kill him. Kill him. Row, 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 row. You shut up. And take those braces off your teeth. <laughs> Gwen, I know how to kill your husband. How? Let's open a window and smog him to death. No. No, Clyde, I have a better way. When he comes home, you hide in the closet. When he hangs up his coat, you can strangle him. And no one will ever know. No one will ever know. Except me. <laughs> 
For I am the fiddler. <laughs> be nice to get home to my loving wife, Gwendolyn. I feel sorry for her. She's alone all day. Are you sure she's alone? Of course I'm sure. About twice a week, our best friend Clyde drops in, but that's only on her birthday. <laughs> Don't be a fool. Your wife is in love with Clyde. Hurry home. You'll find them together. All right, I'll go home and see for myself. You better be prepared. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! You see what I mean? Here are three innocent people, and I have planted the seed of suspicion, which will soon grow into murder. Ain't I a stinker? <laughs> oh, pardon me. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I'm from TWA. Here's a sandwich and keep your big mouth shut. <laughs> Thank you. And now to get back to our story. Clyde is hiding in the closet, and Griffith is about to enter the house. Darling, you're home early. Yes, Gwendolyn. Stop stalking. Ask her about Clyde. Go on, ask her. Huh? Ask her about Clyde. Darling, was Joe here? Not Joe. That was yesterday. It's Clyde today. Now, come on, Griffith. Come on. You've got to get murdered. And hurry up or we'll be in the middle of Amos and Andy. <laughs> go on, go on, open that closet door. No, no, I don't want to, I'm afraid. Come on, come on, don't be a coward. Open that closet door. No, no. Go on, put your hand on that knob. That's it. Now turn it. Good. Now open the door. Folks, come with me to Alabama. There we'll meet my dear old mammy. She's frying eggs. Ooh. Griffith. Griffith, you shot him. No, Gwen, I didn't shoot him. Well, somebody did. I wonder who. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment, but first... Let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in the Lucky Strike, and that's because... L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Fine, light, naturally mild tobacco that gives you smoothness and mildness with never a rough puff. Listen to what Mr. Al Rogers, an independent tobacco auctioneer from Robertsonville, North Carolina, recently said. Year after year, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy fine, prime, ripe tobacco. Tobacco that's just right for mild, good smoking. I've smoked Lucky's for ten years. Millions of smokers, including the famous screen star Hedy Lamar, take a tip from the experts and smoke Lucky Strike. Just recently, the glamorous Hedy said, A good cigarette is like a good movie, always enjoyable. That's why it's Lucky's for me. For your own real deep down smoking enjoyment, light up a Lucky. Let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. Get a carton today. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be with you again next Sunday night when we will have as our guest a very famous daughter of a very famous father, Miss Sarah Churchill. Be sure to hear Dennis Day in A Day in the Life of Dennis Day. Jack, Mary, Dennis, Don, Phil, and Rochester came to you transcribed. Now stay tuned to Amos and Andy, which follows immediately over most of the same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Jack Benny Program, transcribed and presented by Lucky Strike. The cigarette that's toasted to taste better. From Rexall. It's the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show, presented by the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist, welcoming you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have added the word Rexall to their own store names. You know us by the orange and blue Rexall sign on our windows. And that sign means that we carry the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Each one scientifically compounded to do a job for you. Take Rexall's famous mouthwash, MI-31, as an example. MI-31 is a special antiseptic formula that kills contacted germs almost instantly when used full strength, yet will not harm delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. It's quality like that we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. And now your Rexall family druggist brings you the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show, written by Ray Singer and Dick Chevrolet, with Elliot Lewis, Walter Tetley, Robert North, Janine Roos, Anne Whitfield, Walter Sharp and his music, yours truly, Bill Foreman, and starring Alice Fay and Phil Harris. Mr. Scott of Rexall has asked Phil to call the band together so that he might address them on a matter of importance. It must be very important, for Mr. Scott has been talking to the boys for over two hours. And as we look in, he is just finishing his speech. And in conclusion, gentlemen, I'd like to say that any resemblance between you and musicians is not only accidental, but downright malicious. (laughs) Now then, are there any questions? Yeah, who are you? (laughs) I'm Mr. Scott. I represent the 10,000 independent Rexall dealers who pay for this program, and I'm here to see that you do your best for Rexall. Now, any other questions? What's a Rexall? must be pulling my leg. They can't be that stupid. <laughs> they can't, too. <laughs> Fellas, I'll explain what Rexall is. It's one of the world's foremost dispensers of pharmaceuticals. <laughs> Furthermore, it's that's one... Enough, that, that's enough, Harris. <laughs> Their little minds are loused up enough without your... <laughs> I'll explain. <clears throat> A number of years ago, a group of druggists formed a company. They needed a title to identify themselves. And after many months, they came up with a grand old name. You know what they called it? Happy Mary! 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 Grand old name! They didn't call it Mary! Harris, please, you talk to them. My ulcer is starting to nudge me. (laughs) Or or, or better yet, Mrs. Harris, you talk to them. Please, Mr. Scott. You're asking me to lose my self-respect. They won't listen to anybody. If they won't listen to anybody, how does Mr. Harris keep them in line? Well, there's one way. He gets behind a curtain and says, Now hear this. Now hear this. This is Petrillo speaking. (laughs) that work? Well, that depends. If their union dues is paid, they ignore that, too. 
Harris, as the leader of this band, it's up to you to see that they play properly, even if you have to teach them to read music. Them guys know how to read music. And I'll show you. Artie, read what's on your music stand. Abby rents two dollars per day. <laughs> I mean the music. What does it say on the music? Shermer's book one for beginners. <laughs> oh, this is ridiculous. Isn't there anyone in this orchestra who knows what he's doing? Yes, there is. There is one man. My concert master, Mr. Remley. <laughs> Remley? Why, that no-talent slob. Wait a minute. <laughs> Now, just a minute, Mr. Scott. Don't knock Frankie. He's a pretty smart kid. He knows music. Oh, we'll soon find out. Remley, read that music you have in front of you. Say, please. <laughs> All right, please read the music. What music? The sheet of paper you have in front of you. The one with the black dots. That's music? <laughs> I thought I was seeing spots in front of my eyes. I've been having my glasses changed every week. Frankie, listen, now, will you cut out the clowning? Now, stop kidding. Mm -hmm. Now, read your guitar part just the way I wrote it for you. Very well, maestro. It says, when you hear noises coming from the other instruments, you'll know the number has started. <laughs> Don't do nothing until the trombone player hits you in the back of the head. <laughs> At which point you count two, strum once, and put your guitar down before you get in trouble. <laughs> Harris, is that the way you write the music for them? Yeah, I do all my own arranging. <laughs> of course, a little tough with the violin section. They can't read English, and I gotta draw pictures. <laughs> Yes. No wonder these musicians don't know anything. They've got a leader who knows even less. If you learn to read music and play yourself, maybe... Now, wait a minute. minute. Just a minute, sir. I'm not only a fine instrumentalist, but I read music fluently. You do, eh? Let's see you read this. Very well. It's in the key of D-flat, which has five flats, is in the Alla Brave tempo with a fermata on the end chord, finishing with a big piatti. I'll be darned, he did it. I did? Oh, hey, Alice, look at me. I can read music. Frankie, did you hear that? I read the music. I read the music. Exhibitionist. <laughs> what are you trying to do, show the rest of us up? I'm not trying to show nobody up. I'm just gentlemen, trying to Gentlemen, 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 please, please. I'm tired of all this bickering, and I want it to stop right now. Oh, please, Mr. Scott, control yourself. And nobody asked you to butt in. Oh! Oh, you... Oh, God. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Mrs. Harris. I didn't need to shout at you. What's wrong, Mr. Scott? You've been irritable all morning. Yeah, what's up, Scotty? I hate to see you this way. Your usual miserable self. <laughs> I apologize, Mrs. Harris. I'm all upset. It's a personal problem at home. Your wife can't stand you, huh? Frank. <laughs> How can you say a thing like that about such a fine person as Mr. Scott? If he's having any trouble at home, it's because he can't stand his wife. She's probably a nag who spends all his money, runs around with others. Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. I'm not having trouble with my wife. It's somebody else. Your girlfriend, eh? <laughs> oh, no, no, we get along splendid. <laughs> I'm having trouble with my daughter, Marjorie. What's wrong? Well, as you know, she's only 17, and she's fallen in love with a man of 40. There's 23 years difference in their ages, and she wants to marry him. Oh, well, what's so terrible about that? When I married Phil, there was 23 years difference in our ages. The one? Yeah. I happen to like older women. <laughs> I don't mind the difference in their ages so much. It's just that this fellow is a fortune hunter, and he's after Marjorie's money. She's got money, huh? 
I think I can help you, Mr. Scott. When this greedy fortune hunter comes around tomorrow night, tell him that Marjorie is already married. But she isn't married. We're eloping in the morning. <laughs> you wouldn't object to your daughter marrying me, would you? No. No, I wouldn't object. I'd just rather see her dead, that's all. <laughs> Who cares what you think? Have Marjorie meet me at her bank and we'll leave from there. <laughs> and you can send what we can't carry, so we'll... Oh, have a... shut up! <laughs> I'm sorry I mentioned the whole thing. Goodbye. Wow. What's he sore about? I had a solution to his problem, but he wouldn't give me a chance to tell him what I was. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> what are you doing, Artie? We're well, warming up for Alice's song. All right, Alice, start singing. Sing what? What are you playing? What do you care? This fits with anything. <laughs> <laughs> Put another nickel in, in the Nickelodeon. All I want is having you and music, music, music. I'd do anything for you, anything you'd want me to. All I want is kissing you and music, music, music. Closer, my dear, come closer. The nicest part of any melody is when you're dancing close to me. So put another nickel in, in the Nickelodeon. All I want is loving you and music, music, music. Put another nickel in and watch your favorite music begin. about Mr. Scott's problem? You know, it's pretty serious. And I think we ought to help him. I know one thing. I wouldn't want my daughter married to a fortune hunter. Now you know how my father felt about you. <laughs> oh, honey, when I married you, I didn't know you had money. <laughs> By the time I found out, it was too late to back out, and I have suffered through it. <laughs> an idea. All we have to do is make Marjorie forget this older man she's going with. I know that, but how? Well, let's find a young, handsome, clean-cut, typical American boy that she can fall in love with. Yeah, but after she falls in love with me, then what happens? <laughs> I wasn't talking about you. But honey, will you listen to me? I'm the only one to make Margie forget this guy. If you remember, when I met her last year, she practically swooned over me. She had a terrific crush on me. That's right. The poor, weak-minded child did. <laughs> well, let's get over to the house and you can talk to her. Hey, Curly, what makes you think you'll be able to get Margie to forget this other guy? Are you kidding? What, are you kidding? <laughs> no, kidding. I'm not kidding. No, kidding. I'll make her forget him like that. Before I married Alice, she was going with Tyrone Powers. 
Alice, tell him. How long did it take me to make you forget Tyrone? Ten years. <laughs> Man, I've only known you eight years. You still have two years to go, dear. <laughs> And so, Mr. Scott, that's, well, that's what we're doing over here. We want to help you. In short, as long as you're not capable of handling your family affairs yourself, we'll do it for you. <laughs> that's very nice of you, Rimley. I appreciate your efforts in my behalf, and I'll thank you to keep your big, fat nose out of my ear. <laughs> Mr. Scott, uh, look, don't you want our help? Curly, don't ask him. Look, Scotty, we're going to help you. I don't want your help. You're going to get it whether you want it or not. Now get lost. we got work to do. Please, Frankie. Mr. Scott, very often children resent interference from their parents, and we thought, well, perhaps, you know, we might make Marjorie understand. That's right. Now just let me talk to her for five minutes. That's all. Five little minutes. Now where is she? She's in the den. Do you think you can influence her? Scotty, five minutes with me and you won't be able to take her out of the house without a leash. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, filthy, here you go again making a female happy. <laughs> Happens to be my business. <laughs> yes, sir, I hope seeing me again doesn't stagger the girl. <clears throat> Uh-oh, there she is. Uh, hiya, Margie. Hello, Curly. <laughs> Got her on the ropes already. <laughs> I see uh, you didn't forget me. How could I? I once had a terrific crush on you. Yeah, you did, didn't you? Wasn't I a silly little child? <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say silly. Uh, discriminating is a better word. Perhaps, but at any rate, it's all over now. Is it, my dear? <laughs> oh, yes. This time I'm really in love. There's only one man for me, and that's Mr. Crail. <laughs> Crail? Is, is his first name Clyde? <laughs> uh-huh. Clyde Crail. <laughs> How do you like that? I always thought that was a name I made up. <laughs> Say, Margie, but look, honey, after knowing me, how could you even look at anyone else? Because Mr. Crail is more romantic than you. Oh, pull yourself together, kid. This Crail is just a preliminary boy. With me, you is messing with a main event. <laughs> You were quite a ladies' man in your day. <laughs> what do you mean, in my day? Well, Clyde is ever so much younger than you. He's only 40. <laughs> <laughs> well, how old do you think I am? You must be at least 42. What do you mean? I've... I'll settle for that. <laughs> Honey, why think about this older man when uh, uh, when I'm available? But you're not available. You're married to Mrs. Harris. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must finish writing this letter to Clyde. Goodbye. Clyde, Clyde. The impossible has happened. Harris has been rebuffed. Oh, could I be losing my charm? No. <laughs> Poor kid must have astigmatism or something. <laughs> Well, Phil, how did you do? Well, uh, well, practically had her in the boat, but she slipped the hook. <laughs> Losing your touch, huh, Curly? I guess you're not as seductive as you think you are. I am, too, and I'll prove it. It's just because I'm married. She's a nice kid, and she doesn't want to take me away from poor old Alice. <laughs> Look, I'll show you. Alice, all you've got to do is to go in and tell Margie that you've given me up. I, I... ain't going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Johnny, it's to help the girl and watch your grammar. <laughs> We're just pretending. If you tell her you're giving me up, she'll be amenable to my approach. She'll think that... Amenable! <laughs> Sounds crazy to me, but if you think it'll work, I'll try it. Good. Now, Remley, you go inside and keep Scotty busy so he doesn't bother us. Right. And, Alice, all you have to do is to tell Margie that you're giving me up, and she'll take the cue, and the rest is going to be a cinch. Now, go ahead. Wait a minute, honey. Look. Leave the door ajar. I want to hear Marjorie pant when you tell her the news. Okay, dear. Hello, Marjorie. Hello, Mrs. Harris. What are you doing here? Well, I... I have some news that I know will interest you, and I came to tell you. You see, I'm leaving Mr. Harris. A very wise move. <laughs> How the kid's being subtle. Well, Marjorie, you don't understand. I'm giving Mr. Harris up so you can have him. What would I want with him? She doesn't want to appear anxious. <laughs> now, look, dear. You needn't pretend with me. I know you want him. But I don't want him. You can keep him. I don't want to keep him. I'm giving him to you. <laughs> I don't want him. I wish they wouldn't fight over me like that. <laughs> I'm not worth it. Marjorie, please take him. But I don't. Look, look. I'll make you a sporting proposition. You can have Mr. Harris and 13 points. <laughs> Don't palm him off on me. Why are you so anxious to get rid of him? I've outgrown him. That's why I'm giving him to you. I've outgrown him, too. Hear them dames talk, you'd think I was an old girdle. <laughs> Marjorie, why don't you take him? He's too old to make any trouble. He'll just lie around the house. No. He'll make a wonderful watchdog. He barks when strangers come in. I'm sorry, Mrs. Harris, but I already have a dog. But he ain't got a pedigree like mine. <laughs> oh, Marjorie, if you're not interested, I guess I'll run along. Well, Phil, Marjorie won't even take you I know, a... I know, I know. I told you. Watchdog. I told you this wouldn't work. What we need is a nice boy her own age to take her mind off this other fellow. Phil. Phil, I know just the boy. Who? Julius. Julius? <laughs> I'd rather see her go steady with Cecil the C6 Sea Serpent. <laughs> now, Julius is a nice boy, and he's just about her age. But, Alice, don't, don't you... Don't argue. Go call him and tell him to come over here. Oh, all right. Curly, I don't get it. Why did you call Julius to come over? Well, it was my idea. I thought we could use Julius to lure her away from the other fellow. Fine bait. Would be kinder to throw her a hunk of doped horse meat. <laughs> He's such a contrary kid. How'd you get him to come over? I appeal to his romantic side. I told him I want him to make love to a beautiful girl. And I certainly wish he'd hurry and come on... Hey, relax, Bob. Errol LaBruzio is reporting for duty. Well, it's about time you got here. Do you know what you're supposed to do? Sure. You told me over the phone that you want me to take a pretty blonde away from a no-good fortune hunter. That's right. Now get started. Okay, step aside. Miss Faye, fly with me and I'll rescue you from the clutch of this money-mad <laughs> Alice ain't the girl. It's Mr. Scott's daughter. Oh, now you're after her money. It's not me. <laughs> There's another guy after her money and we want oh, you to... Oh, Curly, what's the use? Marjorie won't even look at him. He's such an obnoxious little brat. As himself, yes. <laughs> but I've got an idea. Now look, Julius. She likes my type. And I thought instead of being your usual repulsive character, that you could act like me. Oh, instead of being repulsive, you want me to be nauseating. <laughs> Never mind. I do this myself, but I'm a little old for Marjorie. But she loves my personality. She loves your personality? There's just one thing I want to know about this girl. What? How'd she get hurt? <laughs> Why should I get involved with this Daffy Dame? Well, she's not Daffy. She's Mr. Scott's daughter, and she's a very nice girl. 
please, Julia. Do it for me. All right, Miss Fay. I'll do it for your sake. I'll... Julia's quiet. Here comes Marjorie. Now, remember, act just like me and you're a cinch. Okay. <clears throat> oh, Margie, hi. Uh, I want you to meet a young friend of ours. Uh, Miss Scott, this is Julia Sabrosio. Hello, Julia. Oh, come with me to Alabama. Come and meet my dear old pappy. He's always boiled and oh, so happy. And that's what I like about that sound. Yeah. <laughs> What the heck was that? I think he's cute. Yeah. Ain't I? <laughs> Do you think I'm cute, Julia? You'll have to ask me later. I'm too busy thinking about how cute I am. <laughs> well, you're, you're different than any other boy I ever met. You're so unusual. You're so... You're so right. <laughs> I'm the greatest boon to American womanhood since the Nylon 90. <laughs> Alice. Alice, please, tell me I don't act like that. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you you don't. But you do. <laughs> Marjorie, prepare yourself for a thrill. I'm taking you out tonight. Gee, you're so masterful. You ain't just beating your gums, Myrtle. Shut up, Judge. Marjorie, Marjorie. Yes, Daddy? Your mother and I have reached a firm decision about this Mr. Crail. Who? Mr. Crail, your fiancé. Oh, him. Daddy, I want to introduce you to a new boy I just met. This is Julius Abruzio. Julius? You mean you and Julius... You said it, Dad! (laughs) (laughs) Now that I'm practically your son-in-law... You are not my son-in-law. It's just a question of time. Now, the first thing I'm going to do when I become vice president in charge of the Rexall radio program is to cut down on expenses. Now, just a minute, young man. Nobody asked you to change our radio program. I know a way we can break Mr. Harris's contract. I don't care what you know about... You do, my son? Let's go into the library and talk this over. Hey, Mr. Scott, don't listen to him. Julius, what are you doing to me? Now, just what did you have in mind, my boy? Hey, Julius, now, Julius. now, as I see it, Pop, all we got to do Julius. is prove that these two guys have no Julius. talent which shouldn't Julius. be hard. Julius. Keep talking, Julius. boy. I love Julius. your style. Alice and Phil will be back in just a moment. But first, here's your Rexall family druggist. The other day I was telling a customer about one of Rexall's best-known products called Bismarex. Oh, you don't have to tell me about Bismarex. I already know for myself what swell relief it is for acid indigestion. Well, as a matter of fact, that's exactly what this customer said. But wouldn't you still like to know why that's true? Well... Yes, I guess I would. Well, the secret lies in the scientifically developed formula for Bismarex. You see, the active ingredients in Bismarex vary in the time it takes them to dissolve in the stomach. That way, the relief it gives is not only prompt, but continuous and prolonged. Excess acidity is often neutralized within one minute. Then, the other ingredients, dissolving more slowly, ease up those acid gastric pains, and finally... Bismarck leaves a soothing protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. No wonder Bismarck is so popular. Well, ma'am, 10,000 family druggists don't wonder about it. You see, we know you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexol. Good health to all from Rexol. Gentlemen, 
the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, presents The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. If you like good beer, you'll find it pays to be curious and learn about Schlitz for yourself. Now, the Halls of Ivy. That's around us here today, and we will not forget, though we be far, far away. Welcome again to Ivy, Ivy College, that is, the town of Ivy, USA. Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, president of Ivy, has been working in his study all morning. But he leaves it now to join his wife, the former Victoria Cromwell of the English musical comedy stage. As he enters the living room, Mrs. Hall says, Oh, I'm glad you're finished, Toddy. Vicky, I am never finished. And why should you be glad? Outside of the fact that naturally you can't stand being without me for a minute. Hmm. You're not going to feel so good when I remind you that today is a faculty tea at Mrs. Quincannon's. Oh, that doesn't disturb me a bit, my dear. A legitimate function of the president's wife. I think it's quite proper that you should attend all faculty teas. Not me. We. Oh, no, no, no. You don't, yeah. no. And not only that, but you need a haircut. Uh, I'll get ne- one next week, Delilah. <laughs> why do you hate to go to the barber? Uh, my dear girl, I do not hate to go to the barber. Well, then why? I if... do, however, dislike to have the administration of this college subjected to the haphazard analysis and preposterous suggestions of a certain tonsorial artist. The barber. Mm. Doc Fish. Uh, Doc Fish. <laughs> Fish, indeed. He seems to be trying to make up for a million years of silence on the part of his submarine namesakes. <laughs> well, I suppose any barber who's been in the same shop for 30 years has certain rights. Which he abuses constantly. But to a college barber, there is a new generation every four years. You know, Vicky, there are a lot of people... Daddy. ...who never leave a campus without having Daddy. some... Huh? You're trying to change the subject. Oh, oh. I want you to get your hair cut, and I've made an appointment for you. Is there a slight strain of bulldog in you? With a trace of bloodhound, I'll be following you all the way. Oh. Do I get some lunch before I tackle the fish? Oh, it's not fish, sir. It's cheese souffle. Oh, is lunch ready, Penny? Yes, sir. But if the doctor likes some oh, fish, thank you I... just the same, Penny. Mrs. Hall has already ordered mine. <laughs> afternoon, Mr. President. Oh, Doc. How are you? Busy. You're five minutes early. But there's no one in the chair. Your appointment's for two o'clock, Doctor. I'll be ready for you at two (laughs) o'clock. All right, Doc. I'll wait. Heard your talk in chapel last week. Oh, yes? And? Didn't sound much like a sermon to me. It wasn't. Ministers are supposed to give sermons, ain't they? I'm not a minister, What was you doing in the pulpit, then? Uh, Doc, may I ask you a question? Shoot. If your cat had kittens in the oven, would they be biscuits? (laughs) Step in the chair, Doctor. It's two (laughs) o'clock. Thank you. Ah, ah, That's better. Ah, I think I'll just doze a little... I've been wanting to talk to you. No, 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 please don't. No, no, just cut my hair and your conversation. I'd like to take a nap. Got something on my mind. Glad you stopped in. Because it's important to this school what I've got to say. As long as nobody else seems to take enough interest, it's up to me to do something about it. I'm going to do it. Right now. I give up. What is it, Doc? Know a kid named Eddie Gray? Yes, yes, I do indeed. What about him? He buys a lot of magic stuff at the campus bookshop. You know about that? Oh, yes, yes. A lot of magic stuff and plenty of other things have been disappearing. That's a good trick, too. You mean stolen? Yes, that's what you'd call it. About 500 bucks worth. 
Well, why do you connect Eddie Gray with this? Not many students buy magic stuff. Uh, uh, Doc, our founding fathers provided that any citizen accused of crime was entitled to a jury of his peers, competent legal counsel, and a qualified judge. Well, who then are you to constitute yourself judge, jury, and executioner? I got eyes and ears. Yeah, so is a three-toed sloth. <laughs> and about the same lofty conception of justice. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You know he sold that big car of his. Know he's running around the campus looking like a bindle stiff. Looks like he sold all his good clothes. Looks like he maybe needed some dough. Eddie Gray needs money like I, as the saying goes, need a hole in the head. Have you talked to anyone else about this? Nope. Figured it was your job to handle it. Well, I'll handle it. Are you a betting man, Doc? Well, I know where you can get a little bet down. Oh. What's the horse? <laughs> the, um, the, the, the horse is a gray, Doc. And I'll lay you eight to five, he comes in on top. Oh, Vicky. Yes, my darling. Oh, you do look divine and smell. I have to tell you, darling, that no, I... No, no, don't. I'm about a friend. I'm a sniff. What? Absolutely heaven's heaven. No, no, no. Stop, stop smelling. <laughs> I must talk to you. All right. Stop. What did Doc Fish do? Throw out the whole curriculum? And worse. He's completely revised the laws of evidence. Have you seen Eddie Gray lately? Every day, Toddy, at rehearsals. He's just wonderful. Is he making friends? Mm, he's the happiest boy in school. Everybody likes him. And his magic act is going to be the hit of the follies. You remember when you advised him, and I think I did too, to get rid of his flashy car and expensive clothes? Certainly. And he did it right away. Now he dresses just like all the other students. If you can call that dressing. I sometimes think they simply hold a suitcase over their heads and open it. <laughs> and they just wear whatever falls onto them. <laughs> well, what about Eddie Gray? Well, there's been some stealing going on at the campus bookshop. He is around there a great deal, and he's suspected. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Yes, I thought so, too. But I have a feeling someone has found out who his father is. And if so, Eddie is being pronounced guilty... By association. Oh, no. Oh, I hope not. It'd be too tragic for him just at this time when everything's beginning to go well. I know, but Mike Mallott is too important a public enemy to be kept undercover very long. If someone has found out that he is Eddie's father, well, it's natural to point an accusing finger at the boy. Oh, we've got to clear him, Toddy. I know he's all right. Oh, we're going to try, my dear. Look, I'll ask him to come over, will you? Yeah, uh, what'll we do about the Queen Cannons? That seems to be a fair question. Yeah. Any answers? Uh, only one. Uh, I consider it a legitimate function of the president's wife. I think it's quite proper that you should attend all yeah, faculty yeah, yeah. teas. Well, you said that, and then uh, I said, not me, we. <laughs> That's enough, Victoria. Let's now go on. I don't need another haircut. <laughs> Mr. Gray, to see Dr. Orr. Oh, show him in, Penny. Uh, do, do, don't go, Vicky. This is your case as much as mine. Well, I'm glad. I want to stay. Hello, Dr. Hall. Oh, Gray. Oh, hello, Mrs. Hall. Hello, Eddie. You uh, sent for me, sir? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, sit down. Thank you. I wanted to see how you were getting along. Oh, great. Thanks to some good advice from you and Mrs. Hall, I've been having a swell time. I never knew there were so many nice guys and gals in the world. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Eddie... I'm going to be very direct with you. Yes, sir? Have you heard from your father lately? Oh, sure. He sneaked down here to see me ten days ago. He did? Yeah. He knew I wanted a set of Joseph Conrad's books, so he came down and bought them for me. I'm not apologizing for what he used to be, Dr. Hall, and neither is he, but to me, he's been great. Did he buy you the books at the campus bookshop? Yeah, he did. Oh, it's a terrific set. Well, it sure ruined my allowance. Has anyone told you of the recent robberies at the campus bookshop? Why, yes, sir, I did hear something. Has anyone told you that you are suspected? Me? Suspected of stealing? Oh, now, just a minute, Dr. Well, Hall. Calm down, calm down, Eddie, please. We're not accusing you. On the contrary, we want to clear you. But to do it, we'll have to find out everything we can. And you can help us. Tell us everything you know about it. I don't know anything about it. If we're going to try to help, you must do your part. 
It's beyond just you and us. It's a matter of this college's reputation. And a little thing called justice. Uh, uh, Gray. Yes, sir? Just for the record, have you stolen anything from the campus bookshop? No, sir. Uh, Of course you haven't. Do you know who has? No, sir. You know, but you won't tell. Isn't that it? This can be very serious if you don't, Gray. It involves the honor of the whole college. Look, Doctor, I can't tell you anything... I'm sorry, really sorry, sir, but I wish you'd remember one thing. I've got to do what seems right to me. And please don't ask me to do something that doesn't fit with my own rules. You know, this is where I learned about honor, doctor, and and values. Right in this room. From you, both of you. You gave me a lot to hang on to. Now, don't ask me to let it go. was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. In just a moment, we'll return to the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. But first, let's hear the story of a young go-getter who set out to make an impression, but wound up by being impressed. Give me five minutes alone with the boss, I used to say, and he'll know what a live wire he's got in his organization. That's what I used to say. Well, The other day, the boss invited my wife and me to spend an evening at his home. I knew my big opportunity had arrived. I had a whole evening in which to sell yours truly to the boss. I could just see myself drawing on a mild Havana and giving the old boy a couple of pointers on how to clear up that situation in the sales department. Yes, I had it all planned. But somehow it didn't quite work out that way. I should have known it the minute I saw the boss's house. He and his wife were as simple and friendly as the people next door, but the living room was lush with antiques, oriental rugs, and original oil paintings. I couldn't help staring, but at least I did manage to keep from saying, Gee whiz. Still in all, the evening passed very pleasantly. The boss talked about art and music, showed us his collection of rare prints and first editions, and finally served us some Schlitz beer. Now, naturally, I didn't admit that I'd never tasted a beer as famous as Schlitz. So I took up my glass as though I were an old slitch drinker from my way back. Actually, I-, I could hardly wait to find out if my boss's taste in beer matched the good taste he showed in other things. I took a deep swallow of Schlitz and found out that it did. The same luxury was there. A luxury of flavor that, that matched the paintings and the prints and the first editions. It was then I realized what had happened. I had come to make an impression, but as it turned out, I was the one who was impressed. No wonder they call Schlitz the beer that made Milwaukee famous. return to the halls of Ivy, we find a tenseness not often to be found in the home of the halls. Oh. Please sit down, Toddy. You've been pacing like that for an hour. No, I can't, Vicky. I've got to make some sense out of all this. Obviously, Gray is protecting someone else. Mm. It's a terribly difficult spot for you. You who've been teaching him integrity. Oh, yes, yes, I know integrity. A splendid, glowing word. Nine letters, the nine old men of character. You know, my darling, it's not enough simply to present the idea of integrity to a youngster. That's merely planting the seed. The harvest comes when integrity is put to the test and found to be a source of pride and self-respect and growth. Fortunately, it's usually a habit-forming virtue. Anyway, that's why we can't afford to have Eddie Gray fail to pass his first real test. Toddy, dear, the longer I know you, the more conscious I am of the wisdom in simple decency. Well, I only hope my simple wisdom is adequate to get Eddie clear. If this gets into the newspapers, the boy's life is ruined. With his father's record to help pull him down, he's finished. Even if he's innocent? Oh, his innocence will be shouted down by mob judgment. 
When a man has been accused in headlines on page one, it's difficult to clear his name with a retraction in small print on page 22. Uh, I've got to make Eddie talk. You'll never do it, William. Eddie has a code. Telling tales, even if justified, violates that code. And, and you'd be wrong to insist. Someone has to talk. Speaking of talk... Yes? Why don't you go back where you started? Duck fish, yes. of course. Oh, oh, Vicky, what would I ever do without you? You'd never have your hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear, worse than that. Without you to advise me, I'd have far too many uh, close shaves. <laughs> <laughs> come with you, or do you think I'll make Doc Fish, uh, Fish self-conscious? <laughs> My dear, if you, Alexander the Great, and Lady Godiva's horse walked into that shop together, the man would never turn a hair. <laughs> oh, he has the imperturbability of intellectual density. Let's go. Back again, Mr. President. Didn't Mrs. President like your haircut? It was a fine haircut, Doc. But I think you gave Eddie Gray a crooked part. Huh? Uh, Doc, I'm very disturbed about your accusation of the Gray boy. Been thinking about him myself. I talk too much, always blabbing. Why did you do it? Can't stand his father. Saw him at the bookshop, put two and two together. And they added up to a number on Eddie's back. How did you know who his father was? Friend of mine in Chicago, racketeer, wrote me. Your bookmaker? No, my book is a local man. Uh, I'm... <laughs> I mean, no man. Have you told anyone else about this? No, and I'm not going to. I'm going to shut up from now on. Mm, splendid idea, if it's not too late. But we've got to find out who is doing the stealing. Can any of your Chicago friends tell you that? Probably could if they was here. I'll help all I can. Sorry I started it. And you don't know anything more than you've told us? No. Nope. I just suspected this kid right off. Shouldn't have, I suppose, but I did. When I think something, I speak my mind. Loud, too. <laughs> Beg your pardon, ma'am? Uh, never mind. I was just speaking my mind. It's contagious, I guess. Uh, Doc, uh, you've started something that I, as president of this college, must see through to a conclusion. A campus bookshop can be restocked, but the honor of our student body is something else. You know the kid's innocent, Prexy? You know he's guilty. We have an absolute conviction that Eddie Gray is on the level. Look, Mr. President, I'd like to make you one suggestion. <laughs> They're very unlike you if you didn't. Well, what is it, Doc? Give me a little time on this. If I've given this Gray kid a bad deal on account of I got no use for his old man, and he turns out to be innocent, I figure I owe him a little help. You owe him a great deal more than that, my friend. But I prefer not to have this matter talked about, you understand? Leave it to me. Just give me the time I need, and if I don't keep shut from then on, I'll guarantee you can shave me next time. <laughs> and if he doesn't, I will. <laughs> mm, what a day. And it all started out to be so serene. Mm. Well, there's a small silver lining. You missed the faculty tea. <laughs> True, my darling, yes. I wonder what that old rascal Doc Fish has up his sleeve. Mm. At least he's going to stop gossiping about Eddie. I hope so. You know, Vicky, it's so easy to be swayed by preconceived ideas and prejudices. It's very often most difficult to hold a steady course when your whole being cries out to take another path. What are you thinking about now? Well, just for that <laughs> tiny moment, I digressed, my darling. I, I was thinking of myself and you. I wonder if you remember that day in London when I ran up the stairs to your flat, whistling a tune, gay as the air itself. And when I knocked and you opened the door... My William! What a nice surprise. Uh, Vicky, my darling, I was so close I couldn't pass by without... without... Oh, I beg your pardon. I shouldn't have come in. I, I didn't know... Uh, that... William, this is Paul Hunter. Paul, d uh, Dr. Hall. How do you do? How do you do? I'm terribly sorry. I didn't mean to intrude. Well, you haven't. We were just having tea. Do you want some? No, I really don't think so, thank you. I'd, I'd better run along. Oh, no, don't go. Uh, are you a medical man, Dr. Hall? No, I'm afraid not, Mr. Hunter. I'm a school teacher. Oh, a school teacher. He's a professor, Paul. A very learned professor in a very beautiful American university. Oh, now, Victoria. On your I... sabbatical? Uh, yes. And not too much of it left. Oh, that's pretty tragic. Vicky and I were just talking over plans to send most of the winter on the Riviera. Mm, doesn't it sound wonderful, William? The blue Mediterranean. 
The white sands, the striped umbrellas in warm sunshine. Yes, it does. Sounds beautiful. We thought we might stay between Nice, Cannes, and Monte Carlo for the entire season. Oh, with any luck, I don't see why not. No, of course. Why not? With any luck. Well, darling, if it's all okay with you, I'll start making arrangements. There's uh, quite a lot of arranging to do, you know. Oh, I do know, Paul. Yes, by all means. Let's do it. Oh, certainly. It would be awful if you didn't. Well, <laughs> I'm off then. It's nice to have met you, Doctor. Oh, thank you, Mr. Winter. I hope you have a nice hunter. I, I mean, Winter. Mr. Winter. <laughs> Goodbye, Paul. I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, He's an absolute pet, that boy. A boy? Oh, oh, yes, yes, he is. A real uh, pet. Doesn't it all sound <laughs> heavenly? Heavenly. William, what is it, dear? You're so down. I wish I were an actor, my darling. I wouldn't let you so easily see my feelings. Your feelings about what, dear? What is it? Oh, the Riviera, under winter skies, with me in America, and you with that hunter fellow on the white sands. Oh, William, I did. You thought. Well, you said that. Oh, you couldn't have. Yes, I know, but you you, did. Yeah, well, I didn't mean that you you could. You thought I was going away with Paul? Well, well, of course. Well, aren't you? Well, yes. Well, that's what I thought. What what, what did you think I thought? I thought you thought. I mean, I think. I thought you must have thought that. Yes, think? yes, I still think that what you thought I thought was... Well, well I, I I just hate to think of it. William, listen. <laughs> Paul is the company manager of Give Them Tears. Oh. And we're taking the whole company on tour. Oh. And Paul, by the way, is very happily married. Oh, Vicky, what an <laughs> idiot I am. No, 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 I'm not. No, no, I'm not. It took considerable intelligence to find and fall in love with a girl like you. Oh, darling, I am a happy man. Oh, not too happy. I want you to be a little jealous of me. So go ahead. I mean, worry a bit. Uh, worry a bit? I, I, shall, I shall worry winter, spring, summer, and fall. All oh, the Easter's and Christmases and New Year's. Is... We shall help each other ring the old ones out and ring the new ones in. I can hear the bells now, Vicky. Happy New Year to Victoria and William. Happy, happy... Dear, it's not New Year's Day. It's the 24th of February. And the telephone's ringing. Uh, the, the telephone? Well, it's uh, probably that hunter fellow to uh, ask. If, uh, oh, 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 yes, the, the, the telephone. Uh, here, you mean. Yes, that's here. what I mean. And you don't have to run it down, dear. It's right here for once. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Hall's residence. Who? Oh, yes, Doc. Well, that's extremely interesting. Yes, do, by all means. Come any time. Thank you for calling. The doc's coming over right away. Doc Fish, the barber? Yes. I mean, there's so many doctors of one kind or another around a college, one has to get used to it. By degrees, as you might say. (laughs) Now, why is Doc Fish called Doc? Uh, He holds the degree of Doctor of Inanity. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it was conferred upon him in 1938 by a group of fun-loving and quite perceptive seniors. <laughs> Not having looked up inanity in the dictionary, he's quite proud of it. <laughs> by the way, Toddy, were you daydreaming again when the phone rang? <laughs> or were you just worrying? No, I plead guilty to the first accusation. I was daydreaming. Now, where did you go this time? Oh, down a wrong road for a bit, and then I found you and came back on the right one. Fine trip. I wish I could go with you on some of these meanderings. You always have such a happy expression on your face. <laughs> of course. That, that's what a daydream is for, for comparison with life itself. And usually life looks a little sorry by contrast. But not mine. No. My, my life with you, Vicky, is so like a daydream... Take pardon, that... sir. A Dr. Fish is calling. Oh, <laughs> Dr. Fish. Oh, yes. Ask him in, Penny, please. Yes, sir. Right this way, please, Doctor. And on your way out, sir, I'd like to consult you about a slight cold in the head. <laughs> Won't be necessary, sister. Take a couple of aspirins and hit the hay. <laughs> Hello, Mr. President. Ah, oh, Doc. Mrs. Pratt. Hello, Doc. Have a chair. You have news for us? Yeah, case is closed. Eddie Gray is in the clear and the real crook is known. And I feel like a louse. Excuse the expression, Mrs. Hall. That's quite all right, Doc. You were a louse. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Uh, how did you get Eddie Gray, um... Off the hook? Yes. Same way I got him on, I talked. In this case, I talked to a friend of mine, sort of a tough guy. Tough and nosy. Kind of a guy that knows how to find things out. He just snooped around till he found a kid that had too much bookshop stock for his kind of dough. 
Then he brought him over for a haircut and a shave. Free. A free shave and haircut? Yep. We put him in the chair, locked the door, and I started to hone my razor while this friend of mine asked questions. <laughs> You'd be surprised how chatty a guy can get with a mug like my friend has hanging over him and a razor waving in the background. <laughs> Who was it, Doc? Mrs. Prez, I've already talked too much. I ain't saying. But any time you happen to go into the campus bookshop for the next three years, you will see him. He'll be working off his charge account. <laughs> hey, look. How did you people get so sure it wasn't Eddie Gray? My husband is a fair judge of character. Yeah, looks like it. What do you think of my character, Dr. Hall? <laughs> oh, you're, you're a simple subject, Doc. I am? Yeah, you have a moronic tendency to leap at erroneous conclusions. Yeah? And, uh, a strong urge toward character assassination. Yeah? Uh, and a lamentable weakness for turning on a conversation and leaving it running. Golly, that's wonderful, Prexy. That's me to a T. How do you do it? <laughs> oh, I, I studied under a great teacher. A doctor of inanity. Me, <laughs> yeah, I got one of them degrees myself. Just honorary, of course. Yes, we know, Doc. Good night. I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. And here again are Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good night, everyone. Good night. We'll be seeing you next week at this time at the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. The other players were Earl Ross, Gloria Gordon, Ben Wright, and Gil Stratton, Jr. Tonight's script was written by Nat Wolf and Don Quinn. Our music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. The Halls of Ivy was created by Don Quinn, directed by Nat Wolf, and presented by the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ken Carpenter speaking. Now, here are we the people over most of these NBC stations. by Colgate Dental Cream and Luster Cream Shampoo. Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth. Luster Cream, the cream shampoo for true hair loveliness. <laughs> the Dennis Day Show with Barbara Heiler, B. Benadera, Dink Trout, John Brown, Charles Dant and the Orchestra, and yours truly, Vern Smith, is written by Frank Galen and stars our popular young singer in A Day in the Life of Dennis Day. Here's Dennis to sing The Old Chaperone. A handsome young man met a pretty young maid Andando in old Barcelona Andando means walking and he had an old chaperone A crone Yes, she had an old chaperone. Maria, the girl, noticed Pedro, the boy, a winking right there in the calle. Now, calle me streets, and no one can make love in these streets with an old chaperone. A crone, no, not with an old chaperone. The old chaperone was her tia, and tia means auntie in Spain. She may have an eye. Maria, but 
you, Pedro, she was a big thing. Oh, Pedro, just smile, every is a maid. The Andes, they sparkle and show her. The Andes mean seat and that's just where he'd like to have kicked the old chaperone, the crone, the bothersome old chaperone. Why don't you go away, said the old chaperone. You're fluttering like a paloma. Now paloma's a bird, and that's just what he gave her. And then he cried in an anguish tone, I hate you, you old chaperone. And then came the day of fiesta. Fiesta! Fiesta! The people all roared. Okay. It sounded so much like fiesta. The auntie just stayed home and snored While auntie was dreaming The lovers were beaming They danced and they sang in the plaza The plaza means square But nobody there was as square as the old chaperone For she left the two lovers alone They respectfully thanked the old crone They said, gracias, old chaperone Olé! A very special tip on hair appeal, girls, from famous beauty authority, Kay Dumont. Lovely hair shining with natural highlights and shadows, sparkling with silken softness, inviting with clean fragrance. That's the natural hair appeal that men prefer. And now such natural hair appeal can be yours with one touch of magic, luster cream shampoo. Not a soap, not a liquid, luster cream shampoo is an amazing new dainty cream that whips up like magic in hard or soft water into a mild, gentle lather that sweeps dullness away. Out of her wealth of cosmetic lore, Kay Dumit blended gentle lanolin with special secret ingredients to achieve this delightful new cream that leaves your hair so easy to manage, so soft and shining with the natural appeal that men love. Ask for the economical dollar jar of luster cream shampoo at your cosmetic counter. Also 30 cent and 55 cent sizes. Discover the secret that women and girls of all ages are learning everywhere. There's a world of glamour in each dainty jar of luster cream. The cream shampoo for true hair loveliness. Well, it's breakfast time as we look in now at the Anderson Boarding House in Weaverville, where our young hero, Dennis Day, rooms. So far, Mr. and Mrs. Anderson are the only ones at the table, and, as usual, Mrs. Anderson is laying down the law to her cuter half in no uncertain terms. Something's got to be done, Herbert. Do you understand me? Uh, yes, snuggle buddy. <laughs> Mildred's almost 22 years old. She should have been married long ago, like every other girl in this town. But she's practically engaged, Poopsie. And I'm sure that the very day Dennis is making enough money to support a wife... Dennis! Yes, I can picture it now. How happy Mildred will be as they wheel her to the altar. <laughs> now, it may not take as long as you think. Didn't Mr. Willoughby promise to give Dennis a raise as soon as he becomes a help in the business? Exactly. You see how hopeless it is? <laughs> Well, the boy just hasn't found himself, that's all, Pussy. Huh? Well, now, it's the truth. Maybe if we stopped criticizing him and helped him plan his future, he... Morning, Mrs. Anderson. Mr. Anderson, is something wrong? You look kind of depressed. We were discussing you. Oh, I see. Dennis, my boy, have you ever tried to find yourself? Why, no, sir. I always know where I am. <laughs> I was referring to your future, son. My future? You may as well know right now that we don't like long engagements in this family, Dennis. If you and Mildred want to be married in the near future, it's up to you to make something of yourself. Yes, ma'am. Can you suggest some, something I could make? <laughs> no, I can't think of a single thing. We're just trying to put you on the right track, my boy. You've got confidence in yourself, haven't you? No, sir. <laughs> Well, at least you can go to your boss and tell him that you've got to have a chance for advancement or else, can't you? No, sir. Dennis, where's your courage? Same place as my confidence. Oh, it's 
Hopeless, Herbert, hopeless. Come along. Now, wait, dear. Wait nothing. There are some men in this world who are really men, who can do a man's job. There are others who are incapable of it. But, dear... I said, come along, Herbert. You still have the upstairs to clean and the ironing to do. <laughs> Very well, Lotus Leaf. <laughs> Good morning, Mother. Daddy. Good, Good morning, morning Mildred. Come along, Herbert. Were you and the folks having a talk, Dennis? Yeah. Your mother has finally come to the conclusion that I couldn't possibly be a success at anything I tried. Why, where on earth did you get such a crazy idea? I think it was from observing me constantly at close range. <laughs> well, of all the nonsense. Don't you believe it, Dennis. They said things like that about all great men. Honest? Of course. They said Thomas Edison would never amount to anything, didn't they? And one day he invented the electric light. You can do the same thing. Wouldn't it be kind of silly when you can buy them so cheap? <laughs> that isn't what I mean. All you need is a little nerve. Like going to your boss, Mr. Willoughby, and telling him off good. Oh, golly, Mildred. Dennis, can... say if you don't find the courage to do it this very day, I'll never speak to you again. Mildred, you don't mean that. I certainly do. Well, I'll try. But don't be surprised if I come home tonight and hand you a book on sign language. <laughs> Dennis, is that... Why, John McNulty. How are you, John? Oh, pretty good, Willoughby. What are you doing down here, John? I thought you'd be up at the state capitol, getting your party's election campaign started. Well, the race for mayor in this town looks a little tricky this year, Willoughby, so I came down to take charge. Our boy, Honest Jim, wants to be re-elected, you know. He's still making payments on his yacht. <laughs> John, how do you explain to the voters that the mayor can buy a $20,000 yacht on an $800 a year salary? We tell him he's very thrifty. <laughs> oh, that's it. Yeah. But you see, there's two strong parties this year. The Free Independent Citizens' Liberty Party. That's us crooks. <laughs> and the Reform Party. Uh -huh. The Reform Parties come out for lower taxes, better roads, higher pay for teachers, that sort of thing. Radicals, huh? <laughs> yeah. Our boy, Honest Jim, may have a little trouble this year. Personally, I'd like to chuck the whole thing up and retire to my toll bridge. <laughs> but it's for the good of the party. Well, you might be able to beat the Reform Party if you could split their vote. Split their vote? How? Oh. By running an independent candidate. A dummy. He'll take votes away from the Reform Party, and Honest Jim will walk in on your machine vote. Say, that's great. Now, but where could we find a guy stupid enough to run for it? <laughs> Fella, <laughs> fella, dopey enough to think he has a chance. A man so innocent that we can twist him around. Morning, Mr. Willoughby. Hey. Short search, wasn't it? <laughs> I beg your pardon, gentlemen. No, it's no good, Willoughby. I'm afraid he won't do. Oh, now, wait. You said you needed a man with certain qualifications. Well, Dennis That's here. obvious, but there's a point where even the voters will draw the line. <laughs> I beg your pardon, gentlemen? He could be built up with publicity, couldn't he? Well, anything's possible, of course. I guess but... two's company and three's a crowd. Goodbye. Dennis, come back here. Now, listen, my boy. I've always told you you could go somewhere, haven't I? <laughs> Never in such a quiet voice before. <laughs> well, my boy, I've got a proposition that's going to floor you. How would you like to be the mayor of Weaverville? Mr. Willoughby, have you been browsing around among the medicinal alcohol again? <laughs> Dennis, I'm serious. Quick, how many fingers am I holding up? No, stop that. <laughs> but, Melty, your troubles are over. This is your candidate for mayor right here. I think you're right, Willoughby. Gosh, they're both loaded. <laughs> Now, let's look at this boy and see what he's got for politics. Well, he's a war veteran, honest as the day is long, not a black mark on his record. Uh, that doesn't mean a thing, Willoughby. He sings and plays the banjo? Now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> My boy, go home and put on your best suit. You're calling on Senator Tom Harrington down at the hotel. Senator Harrington? 
But doesn't he usually support the Reform Party candidate? Well, that's just it. If we can get him to endorse Dennis this time, we've started the split. But if we want him to endorse Dennis, isn't it dangerous to let him see Dennis? <laughs> All Dennis has to do is agree with everything the senator says. The senator will love him. I see. All right, Dennis, get going. Gee, you're, you're serious about this, then? You really want me to run for mayor? Of course we do, my boy. Gosh, Mr. Willoughby, this is the happiest day of my whole life. And if I'm elected, I promise you'll never regret it. I promise I'll make Weaverville a town to be proud of. I promise I'll... Gee, isn't it wonderful? I sound like a candidate already. (laughs) Mildred! Why, Dennis, what are you doing home so early? Oh, Mildred, I got the most wonderful news. Remember how your mother said there was absolutely nothing I was equipped to do? So? So I've decided to become a politician. (laughs) A politician? Yeah, I'm running for mayor. Mayor? Dennis, have you gone crazy? How could you possibly... Dennis! Oh, so you don't believe me, Mildred. Well, here's my campaign manager, Mr. Willoughby. Dennis, well, you don't take that seriously about running for mayor, did you? Don't you know who that man was in my store? Boss McNulty. Boss McNulty? Why, he's the crookedest politician in the state. Sure. I thought up that scheme to run those thieves out of town. Huh? McNulty doesn't want you to become mayor, Dennis. He's got his own candidate. Honest Jim Dome. Well, that's a fine thing. (laughs) And I was supposed to see the Senator Harrington this afternoon and get his endorsement. Well, I won't go. Oh, yes, you will. We've changed my mind. (laughs) I don't get it either. Don't you see? If Dennis insults the senator and ridicules all his policies, he'll come out for the reform candidate, the man McNulty's really afraid of. Gosh, Mildred, I've got to hand it to you. That head of yours is so heavy with brains, it's a wonder you can keep your neck up. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dennis. Mildred's right, Dennis. McNulty is beaten if you can get the senator really mad at you. You think you can? Are you kidding? People get mad at me when I'm not trying. When I am, I'll be sheer murder. <laughs> Dennis Day, did you say the name was? That's right, Senator. Candidate for mayor on the independent ticket. Ah, I see. Question of endorsement. Well, frankly, Day, I lean a little toward the reform body. Good, I'll give you a push. (laughs) You mean you don't want my endorsement? I got enough handicaps now, pal. Look at your... Look at your policies. What about my policies? What about them? (laughs) Fair. Oh, just a minute. Haven't I taken a firm stand on the slum problem, on the various... The slum problem? What have you done about it? You've been in office six years and you haven't put up a single slum. <laughs> <laughs> no, see here. Then aren't you the author of a bill to help juvenile delinquency? I am. How about that? Don't you think it's growing fast enough without any help from you? <laughs> now you listen here. Policies. Fair. <laughs> Is that all? Are you through? It all depends. What do you think of me? Well... You're certainly outspoken. As a matter of fact, I... I rather like you. (laughs) Then I'm not through. (laughs) You're not? No. For instance, you say you always fight for minority groups. I do? I'm laughing. (laughs) I defy you to name one minority group I haven't fought for. Millionaires! Millionaires? And then you have the nerve to come out in favor of crime prevention. Why, you ought to be ashamed. Being in favor of crime prevention is bad? You know what a thing like that can lead to, don't you? What? Unemployed policemen. Oh, stop. <laughs> had enough? Do you hate me? Well, no, of course not. But then you I... haven't had enough. <laughs> Enough what? Oh, so now you're getting nosy asking questions. The big senator. How many subcommittees are you on? Why, uh, five or six. Five or six? One senator? No wonder we have more subcommittees than we have subs. (laughs) Daddy, that's very funny. (laughs) Oh, it was nothing, really. Oh, you have a capital sense of humor. (laughs) And to think that at first I thought you were serious. (laughs) We couldn't return to that mood, huh? My boy, you certainly have a novel approach. 
Why, you've got the Reform Party candidate last to the mast. I'll be proud to endorse you for mayor. But Senator, you don't understand. I hate you. I hate your policies. Get mad, Senator. <laughs> By Jove, you're a card. And I think you'll make a darn good mayor, too. Goodbye, my boy. No, Senator, no. <laughs> goodbye, goodbye. Good gosh, now what have I done? That's what I get for being tricky. Why didn't I just act normal and let him feel for me what came naturally? But I keep telling you I don't know where Mr. Day is. Look, lady, we go to press in an hour and I want an interview. But it's ridiculous. Mr. Day isn't running for mayor. Don't kid me. We got the tip right from John McNulty. I can't help what, Miss... Oh, Dennis, at last, tell this man you're not running for mayor. I can't. What? We've got some pretty peculiar men running this country, Mildred. The senator likes me. (laughs) Dennis, come into the den. Excuse us a minute, please, mister. Now, what is all this? Well, it's just like I said. The senator's going to endorse me. I came up with all kinds of silly ideas, but they had no effect. How could a man like the senator fail to recognize silly ideas when he heard them? I don't know. I guess he's been in Washington too long. (laughs) Oh, Janice, this is awful. That reporter wants a story from you, and once it's in the paper, you... Wait a minute. You've got another idea, I can tell. That scared feeling is coming over me again. (laughs) Look, all you have to do is tell that reporter your platform. Where does that get me? Right out of the race if you make it bad enough. Just tell him anything you can think of that's bad government. He'll print it, and that's the end of you for mayor. Hey, maybe you're right. I'll get right to work on it. You wanted to see me, son? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mr. Day, I'm from the Bugle. I came for an interview. Can we uh, have your platform for mayor? You bet, son. First thing I'm going to do is open up the town. Uh, I beg pardon? I say, this town's going to be wide open. Lotto, bingo, screeno, penny matching, all foul vices like that. Uh, You don't say. Yep. Next, I promise to close all the schools. That ought to swing the kid vote my way 100%. (laughs) That's not bad. Of course, the kids can't vote. Mere technical triviality. I'm uh, putting it down in your very own words here. Fine. Of course, I may ask you to initial it later. My uh, editor thinks I drink. If you don't, you better learn how. <laughs> know what we're going to have in all the public drinking fountains when I'm mayor? What? Bourbon. <laughs> Bourbon in the drinking fountains. Sure. A lot of our brave boys missed the lush war years, didn't they? Well, we're going to have a lush peace time. Mm. Uh, hold the paper for me, will you? I'm starting to shake a little. <laughs> Glad to, son. You know something, boy? You might be just screwy enough to get elected. Don't say that. Sure. Honest Jim and the reform candidates are, well, they're both dull as dishwater. With them cutting each other's throats, a screwball like you has a wonderful chance. Gosh, your paper isn't going to support me, is it? No, no, and that's another sign in your favor. (laughs) Huh? Oh, sure, my paper has a perfect record. We came out against George Washington, and we've been hitting them that good ever since. Well, (laughs) Mildred, I need you. I know, I heard. What am I going to do? Every time I open my mouth, the votes pour in. Dennis, I've made up my mind. There's only one solution. Yeah, I guess you're right. Come on, then. Let's go. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. What's the solution? Why, we're going to win the election, silly. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't tell you, did I? No, and I was kind of interested. (laughs) Win the election? Me? Certainly. The only one who can beat you is Mr. McNulty's candidate. Mr. McNulty pulled a dirty trick on you, didn't he? Well, we'll pull a dirtier one on him. Had a girl. What do we do? Suppose we manage to get a picture of Mr. McNulty threatening you with a gun in his hand. With a gun in his hand? Yes. This is a dirty trick on Mr. McNulty? <laughs> well, yes. When the picture appears, he'll be out of the race. Suppose he decided to pull the trigger. It'll be a dead heat. <laughs> The gun will be empty, silly. You'll have it in your pocket. 
Then you'll pick a fight with him and let him take the gun away from you. And then what? I'll have that reporter outside the door with a camera. And as soon as we hear you say you wouldn't dare, we burst in and snap the picture. Holy smoke, I wouldn't have your mind for anything. <laughs> you wouldn't dare as the cue, huh? Yes. We'll get Daddy's old revolver out of his drawer. Oh, we can't miss, Dennis, and you'll be the next mayor. Will you do it? I suppose so. But you know something, Mildred? The only difference between my life and the perils of Pauline is that Pauline was all sure of being around for the next episode. <laughs> You're right, Jim. The kid's too strong with the press and the senator behind him. Yeah, let him be mayor for a year and hang himself. Next year, we'll be so strong, they'll never get us out. Okay, Jim, that's it then. We'll withdraw. Yeah. So long, Jim. Come in. Oh, hello, Day. McNulty, I got news for you. I'm going out to win that election and make laughing stocks out of you and your stooge. Oh? Well, more power to you, my boy. Good luck. Oh, yeah? You and who else? <laughs> Didn't you hear me? I said, good luck, my boy. Come out, try and say that. <laughs> Dave, have you gone crazy? Oh, you want to fight, huh? Get your hands up in front of your face and keep them there. I'm going to hit you right in the stomach. <laughs> With you, didn't you hear what I said? I wished you all. I heard what you said, you rat. Take that and that and that. Take what? I don't know, but that's what they always say. <laughs> now, look, didn't you hear me call you a rat? If a fellow said that to me, I'd shoot him. You would? Yes, sirree. I'd take out my gun and shoot him. Well, I don't have a gun. It just so happens that I have. <laughs> What? Here, why don't you grapple with me and take it away? Don't be silly. Go ahead, I grapple easy. Put that thing down, Dave. Oh, come on, old man, let's play the game. Stop, will you? I dare you to take it away from me. I double dare you. You wouldn't dare. Hold it. Hey, wait a minute. He's supposed to be holding the gun, not me. Oh, Dennis. Oh, boy, what a shot. Boy, candidate threatens rival political balls. Wow, thanks, pal. Wow. I didn't think you could lose this election, son, but it looks like you figured out a way. Yeah, that's me. Lucky mornings and normal afternoons. <laughs> oh, it wasn't your fault, Dennis. Well, it looks like we've got a cinch now. Our boy, Honest Jim, will walk in. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll fix him. He won't have a chance. And just how do you intend to beat him? He can't possibly win. I'm going out and campaign for him. <laughs> Dennis Day will be back in just a moment with a song. But first, here's a fact worth knowing. Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. And just how important that is, our Colgate players are about to demonstrate. Seen a picnic. But it's no picnic for our hero. Listen. Jeepers, Janie. Every time I try to warm up to you lately, I get the cold shoulder. What gives, anyway? You mean you definitely don't know, Joe? Oh, Janie, I haven't even got the makings of an idea. That's the trouble with your trouble, Joe. Ask your dentist, won't you? Please. And here's what Joe found out. Scientific tests prove that in seven out of ten cases, Colgate Dental Cream instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. And Colgate's safe polishing agent brings out the natural sparkle of your teeth, cleans them thoroughly and safely. Yes, Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. And Colgate Dental Cream is famous for its wonderful wake-up flavor, too. Nationwide tests of leading toothpastes prove that Colgate's is preferred for flavor over other brands tested. So to clean your teeth thoroughly and safely, for a wake-up flavor everyone enjoys, use Colgate Dental Cream. Remember, Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. With Charles Dant in the orchestra, here's Dennis to sing, That's My Desire.
break of day. That's my desire. We'll sip a little glass of wine. I'll gaze into your eyes divine. I'll feel the touch of your lips pressing. Day show brought to you by Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and left the cream shampoo, the cream shampoo for true hair loveliness. Remember, doctors prove the palm olive plan brings two out of three women lovelier complexions in 14 days. And this beauty plan with palm olive soap was tested on women with all types of skin dry, oily, even skin that was not clear. Yes, 36 doctors proved the 14 day palm olive plan improves all types of skin. Brings fresher, brighter, younger-looking complexions. So get Palm Olive Soap and start your 14-day Palm Olive plan now. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Powder for a breath that's sweet and teeth that sparkle presents the Mel Blanc Show. My lawnmower needs sharpening. I've got to take it to Mel Blanc's Fix It Shop. My wife percolator top is cracked. I've got to take it to Mel Blanc's Fix It Shop. Oh, my stocking has a run in it. I've got to take it to Mel Blanc's Fix It Shop. My wife's going to have a baby. i got to take it to Mel uh, at the hospital. Colgate Tooth Powder for a breath that's sweet and teeth that sparkle brings you Mel Blanc at his own fix-it shop with Mary Jane Croft, Earl Ross, Joe Kearns, Victor Miller and his orchestra, and Mel himself playing those delightful characters Zookie and Dr. Crabbe. The star of our show, Mel Blanc! It's a lovely autumn morning in Mel Blanc's town... Population 7,500. <laughs> Pardon me. Population 7,501. <laughs> the postman, Mr. Snoop, is making his morning rounds. The baker, Mr. Brown, is putting his rolls in the window. And in Mel Blanc's fix-it shop, Mel is just about finished fixing Druggist Simpson's penny-weighing machine. Is the weighing machine all fixed, nephew? Uh, yeah, Uncle Rupert. I believe I'll try it. Hmm, must be something wrong. Why, what does it say you weigh? Seventeen pounds. Uh, do I look that thin? Why don't you read the fortune anyway? Oh, yeah. If you are a woman, you'll marry a man. If you are a man, you'll marry a woman. If you are married, try another penny. 
<laughs> oh, I forgot to push this lever up. Now I'll try it again. Oh, that's better. 120 pounds. What's the fortune this time? You are kind, understanding, friendly, considerate, gentle, and you make enemies too easily. <laughs> oh, here comes that gossipy pipsqueak of a postman, Mr. Snoop. I'll go out for a walk, Melvin, if you don't mind. Okay, Uncle Rupert. Hello, Roop. Goodbye, Snoop. <laughs> Howdy, Mel. Hello, Mr. Snoop. Uh, got a letter for me? No. Do you expect me to write you one? <laughs> oh, I didn't mean a letter from you. Oh, well, just a second here. Oh, first of all, I want you to mend my mailbag. It's all bursted out to the seams. Oh, sure, I can do that in a minute. Uh, any mail for me? Uh, now, let me see here. Hodgkins, 805 North Elm Drives, Blodgett, 807. And that's the third notice Blodgett's got from the library. Why don't you return that book? You know, I got a good mind to go up to Blodgett. Any mail for me? Oh, oh. Let me see here. Simpkins, 809. Ooh, very interesting postcard. Dear Joe, if you've got any more... Excuse me for saying so, Mr. Snoop. (laughs) But I thought postal employees weren't allowed to read the mail. Ooh, well, that's right, mail. Well, you ain't no employee. You read it for me. <laughs> Look, Mr. Snoop, any mail for me? Now, stop poking around my letters. If there's anything I hate, it's nosy people. <laughs> Let me say, Potter, 811. Oh, I say, mail. Mail? No, mail. Uh... <laughs> How about buying two tickets to the postman's ball Saturday night, huh? Only a dollar apiece. Well, I'd like to, Mr. Snoop, but I gave my last five bucks to my uncle. I don't have a cent. Mm. Well, here's your mailbag, all stitched. Uh, what's the charge? Oh, nothing. Gosh, I sure could use two bucks for the tickets. I'd take Betty, and for once we wouldn't have to spend the evening in her parlor. What's the charge? Nothing. I'd dance with Betty, then I'd go out in the veranda and hold her in my arms. And then I'd kiss her and hug her. And... Uh, what's the charge? Nothing. Two dollars, and I'll take the tickets. <laughs> Hello, Mel. Hello, Betty. Gee, you sure look beautiful. Yeah. All dressed up and no place to go. What do you mean, all dressed up and no place to go? Why, I'll take you to the... Uh... Well, uh, how about, uh... Well... I'll take you home. You can change your clothes. Oh, that's it. We never go anywhere. We spend every evening in my parlor. No wonder Father feels the way he does about it. Well, I hate sitting in the parlor just as much as your father does. You do? Yeah, that love seat isn't big enough for the three of us. (laughs) Well, anyway, Betty, I've got good news. We won't be spending this Saturday night in the parlor. I've got two tickets to the postman's ball. Oh, Mel, this is awful. Because this is one Saturday night I won't be able to be with you. But, Betty, why not? Well, Daddy's expecting... Oh, wait a minute. Here comes Daddy himself. I'll, I'll let him tell you. Hello, Mr. Colby. Uh, <laughs> what did you say, Mr. Colby? <laughs> yes, it is a lovely day, isn't it? Uh, Mr. Colby, may I take your daughter to the postman's ball Saturday night? <clears throat> No, huh? But why not, Mr. Colby? (coughs) Well, that isn't much of a reason. What? I mean... Oh, now, listen here, you dimwit. I'm expecting a very important man for dinner this Saturday night. Betty's got to prepare dinner for him and then entertain him. You're making a regular nightclub out of your place, aren't you? No. This Mr. Fisher can help me a great deal with my supermarket. He's president of the Acme Portuguese Sardine Company. And do you know anything more impossible than getting Portuguese sardines? Yeah, getting the sardines out of the can. Oh. <laughs> People come to my supermarket all day and say, Do you have Portuguese sardines? Do you have Portuguese sardines? And all day I say, No, no, no. Well, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. You hear? Mr. Colby, let go of my neck. Oh. I'm not a sardine. Oh. Well, if this Mr. Fisher is so important, you should really be alone with him to close the deal. So why don't I take Betty out to the dance? Betty stays home Saturday night. Well, what about me? Well, you can go to 
go to the dance. <laughs> well, thanks for changing your mind, Mr. Colby. I haven't changed my mind. Now, listen, Mel. If you show up at my house or within five blocks of my house Saturday night, I'll... Well, I'll... Don't say any more. I've got an imagination. All right, then use it. Come on, Mel. Well, I'll, I'll be with you in just a minute. Well, goodbye, Mr. Colby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a nice day, isn't it? Oh, gosh, Betty, this is awful. I sure killed our Saturday night date. This was going to be once we wouldn't spend it in your parlor. Oh, Mel, you know Father. Father talks big. Betty, Father is big. <laughs> now, Mel, you listen to me. I'm inviting you to the house Saturday night, and if you don't show up, you don't have to show up ever again. Goodbye. Bye. Gosh, Betty's Father says no. Betty says yes. Oh, I'm just a pickle in the middle. <laughs> You know, anyone can be the victim of a little breath of trouble. I mean, unpleasing breath. It happens to thousands without their knowing. Marks them down socially. Makes them unhappy. So be on your guard. Brush your teeth night and morning and before every date with Colgate Tooth Powder. For Colgate Tooth Powder cleans your breath as it cleans your teeth. Yes, scientific tests have definitely proved that in seven cases out of ten, Colgate Tooth Powder instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. What's more, no dentifrice at any price cleans your teeth more quickly and thoroughly than Colgate Tooth Powder. Remember to buy it first thing. And remember the name, Colgate Tooth Powder, with the accent on powder. Don't take a chance with your romance. Use Colgate Tooth Powder. Well, here it is Saturday night. Mel still doesn't know whether he's going to use those tickets to the postman's ball. Betty says Mel had better come up to the house or else. And Betty's father, who is trying to get a shipment of Portuguese sardines, says Mel had better not show up or else. Anyway, right now Mel is in his fix-it shop talking to Betty's little brother Axelrod, who has just entered the shop. Well, what's new, Axelrod? Gosh, Mel, is my father mad at you? Well, how do you know? Did your father say anything about me, uh, personally? Well, I didn't hear anything. You didn't? No. Of course, whenever he starts to talk about you, he makes me leave the room. Mm. Well, how about Betty? Same way. While she was preparing dinner, she kept talking to the chicken and calling it Mel. <laughs> well, that shows how much she loves me. She said to the chicken, if you don't come up tonight, I'll... Well, then what'd she say? Nothing. She just dropped it in the boiling water. <laughs> oh. Well, so long, Mel. Oh, so long, Axelrod. Gosh, what a mess this is. If I don't go to Betty's house, I'm a boiled chicken. If I do, I'm a dead duck. <laughs> Uncle Rupert, I can't figure out why Mr. Colby doesn't like me. Well, you read the fortune on your card. You are kind, gentle, observant, tolerant, and you make enemies too easily. You mean I should try to make a friend of Mr. Colby? My boy, when I first met your aunt, I said to myself, I must make a friend of that woman. And what happened? That was the worst decision I ever made. <laughs> Maybe I ought to try it anyway. Why don't I go up there to Mr. Colby and be uh -oh. as nice... Here comes that pompous Mr. Cushing, the president of your lodge. Well, hello, Brother Mel. Ugga, ugga, boo, ugga, boo, boo, ugga. <laughs> Greetings, mighty potentate. Ugga, ugga, boo, ugga, boo, boo, ugga. <laughs> well... <laughs> Just stopped in for a second to remind you about the next meeting of the Benevolent Order of Loyal Zebras. I'll do my best to make it, mighty potentate. It's an honor for you to ask me personally. Oh, not at all. I like to get around among my zebras. <laughs> <laughs> Say, why are you moping around like this? Why, when I was a young man, do you know what Saturday night meant to me? I already took a bath, Mr. Cushing. <laughs> You, you wouldn't understand. Well, I can see you don't want to talk, so I'll say so long. Agga, agga, boo, agga, boo, boo, agga. Agga, agga, boo, agga, boo, boo, agga. Well, now, wait a minute. Anyone who gives the password like that is a worried zebra. <laughs> now, tell me, what's wrong? Well, I wanted to take Betty to the postman's ball, and Mr. Colby wouldn't let me because he's entertaining the president of the Acme Portuguese Sardine Company. And he wants oh, Betty you, to... You don't mean Mr. Fisher, do you? 
Yeah. Do you know him? Why, of course, and you should, too. Fisher's the Grand Wizard of the Jennings Junction Order of Loyal Zebras. We are both Imperial Caliphs on the Executive Council. You mean I'm his fellow zebra? Hmm. I'm his large brother? That's right. Go on up there and tell him so, and uh, mention my name. Oh, but Mr. Colby said... Oh, Colby won't touch you with Fisher there. Fisher's a swell guy. A man I'm proud to call a zebra. Well, so long, Mel. Just give Fisher the old password. Aga, aga, boo, aga, boo, boo, aga. Aga, aga, boo, aga, boo, boo. Aga. Oh, Uncle. Uncle Rupert. Yes, nephew. Uh, watch a shop, will you? I'm going to Betty's house, and I've got to go upstairs to change. Just a second, Melvin. Here comes Dr. Crabb. Well, you take care of the dog, Doctor, will you, Uncle? I'll be right down. All right. Good old Dr. Crabb. He's been taking care of dogs so long, he even talks like one. Ah, good evening, my good dog doctor. Good evening to you, Rupert. (laughs) I've been walking quite a bit, and I'm thirsty. (laughs) Could I have a pan of water? (laughs) Why, sure. Say, Christopher, don't some people think it's funny when they hear you sound like a dog? I don't believe so, Rupert, Except maybe that man at the newsstand on the corner. What did he do? I bought a paper from him, and he put it in my mouth. (laughs) Don't tell me you carried the paper home in your mouth. You know a better way? (laughs) This is Saturday night, Christopher. We're supposed to be closed, you know. I know, but I thought I'd talk to Mel about a special lock from my kennels. My little terrier tried to run away. Really? Oh, yeah, but I caught him. I said to him, and he said, and then I said, and he said, I tell you, that dog is sensational. Why? What do you mean? Well, he understood every word I said. Well, thanks for the water, Rube. My throat feels better already. Well, I'm beginning to sound like myself again. Bye, Rupert. (laughs) Goodbye. (laughs) Good old Dr. Crabb. Well, I'm ready, Uncle Rupert. Uh, You can get Zuki to help you take care of the shop. Well, wish me luck. Good luck, my boy. And it's very late. You'd better hurry if you want to make the dance. So shake a leg. What do you mean, shake a leg? I'm shaking all over. Everything's working out just fine with Mr. Fisher, Betty. That's good. Yes, he loved the dinner. Said it was the softest chicken he'd ever had. (laughs) How right he was. Eh? Oh, well, anyway. Now to carry out the rest of my plan. I'm going to get into a card game with him and let him win some money from me. Let him win money from you? Daddy, is that proper? Proper schmapper. I want those sardines. (laughs) If he wins some money from me, he'll be in the right mood. He... Uh Uh-oh. Here he comes now. Well, Mr. Fisher. <laughs> oh, uh, do you indulge in games of chance? <laughs> well, uh, sometimes I do, yes. Ah, good. <laughs> then how about a game of sardines? Oh, I mean, um, gin rummy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Colby, but I don't like to play cards. <laughs> you don't like to play cards. Well, how about for cheesy? Uh, Monopoly. Uh, Axelrod, you got any chalk? We can even play potsy. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Colby. Be very obliging of you, but as a matter of fact, there is one game that I do play. But I warn you, I'm very good at it. <laughs> it's checkers. Checkers? So very good at it, eh? Uh-huh. Axelrod, get the board and the checkers. Okay, then. <laughs> Nothing like a good, rousing game of checkers, I always say. Hey, Betty? <laughs> oh, I wonder who that can be. Oh, never mind. I'll open it. Hello, Mr. Cole. Oh. <laughs> Who was that? Oh, uh, just a salesman selling vacuum cleaners. <laughs> well, let him in. They're very hard to get. Uh, <laughs> no, I second thought it wasn't a salesman. Somebody I don't know. A Portuguese. Oh, I mean an Eskimo. Oh, I don't know. Uh, oh, dear. I'll get it. Hello, everybody. Oh, hello, Mel. Mel, this is Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher, this is my fiancé, Mel Blank. <laughs> Pleased to meet you, Mr. Fisher. Ugga, ugga, boo, ugga, boo, boo, ugga. What? Well, what do you know? A brother zebra. Ugga, ugga, boo, ugga, boo, boo, ugga. (laughs) 
You see, Mr. Colby, Mr. Fisher and I are friends. Friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I see. <clears throat> Mr. Fisher, here's the checkerboard and the checkers now. Uh, Mr. Cushing uh, sent you his regards, Mr. Fisher. Cushing? Oh, that's the real estate man. Oh, a great fella. <laughs> you know, in our last executive council, he put on a lampshade and imitated Hannah Hopper. <laughs> I tell you, I never laughed so loud. <laughs> Well, you don't have to shout, though. Yeah, you don't have to shout, old man. I mean, uh, here's the checkerboard all set up. <laughs> now, Mr. Fisher, how about playing a game for, say, uh, five dollars, huh? Well, that's okay with me. But I warn you, I'm a wizard at this. <laughs> Do you mind if I kibitz? Mm, well, why don't no, you... No, no, uh... not at all, Brother Zebra. But you better help Mr. Colby there, because I won't need it. <laughs> okay, there's my move. Hmm, very interesting. <laughs> I'm trapped already. <laughs> well, wait a minute, Mr. Colby. Here's a move you can make. Uh, Mel, why don't you close that window from the outside? <laughs> well, Mr. Colby, I might fall out of the window and break my neck. Well, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> well, Mel, move for me. Hmm, very good. Sort of puts me on the defensive. Uh -huh, I'll try this. Okay, here's our move. And here's mine. That's just what we were waiting for, Mr. Colby. Uh -huh. Now you jump this, and this, oh. and this, and this, oh. and that's the game. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah, isn't it wonderful? Well, Mr. Colby, that's $30 I owe you. <laughs> And without my kibitzing, you wouldn't have won at all, Mr. Colby. Well, I know it, and believe me, I won't forget it. Mr. Fisher, how would you like to play one game for $30? Win or lose all, I say. Well, that's a game sport, Mr. Colby. I'll take you on. <laughs> and I'll help you again, Mr. Colby. Mm. Oh, uh, uh, Mel, what's the name of that Chinese laundryman down the street? Oh, you mean so long? What'd you say? So long. Oh, too bad you have to go so soon. So long, man. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Colby. Stop pushing. Oh, come now. Quiet down, everybody. I move. There. Oh, Mel. Uh, not now, Betty. Uh-uh, Mr. Colby. Here's the move to make. Oh, uh, Mr. Fisher, next time you have an executive meeting, invite me down. I do imitations, too. Did you ever hear Bugs Bunny? Uh, listen to this. What's up, Doc? <laughs> I can't even keep my mind on the game. <laughs> well, here's a knife. Go and cut yourself. <laughs> Very funny. Well, I think that $120 are quite enough to owe any man, Mr. Colby. So I'm going to call it quits. There's your money. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Well, what's the matter, Mr. Colby? You're not taking this very well. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Colby is what is known as a sore winner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you certainly are a card, Brother Zebra. A card? He's a whole deck. <laughs> well, good night, and believe me, it's been a pleasure. Well, good night, Mr. Fisher. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Colby... Let me say this for you. Everywhere I'm invited, people get into checker games with me and purposely let me win. Uh, you know you're the first man who ever had guts enough to beat me. I admire you. <laughs> yeah, that's just the way I feel, Brother Zebra. And uh, by the way, Mr. Colby, I just got in a large order of Portuguese sardines. Now, I don't know whether you know this or not, but... They're almost impossible to get. Yeah. Really? I, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, but Mr. Colby, you told me Mel. that. <laughs> well, you call me in the morning, Mr. Colby, and you let me know how many you want. <laughs> so now, good night, and, uh, ugga, ugga, boo, ugga, boo, boo, ugga. <laughs> oh, what a night, what a night. Mel Blank! Yes? <laughs> Go and take Betty to the dance. Oh, Thanks, Daddy. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Come on, Betty. Betty, this is the first Saturday night we won't be spending in the parlor. Oh, gosh. Won't we have fun? This tickle.
make it good for one admission to the post... Mel. What's the matter, Betty? These tickets are for next Saturday night. Next Saturday night? Uh Uh-oh. Back to the parlor again. Young man, whether you're calling on a customer or calling on your best girl, remember this. A little breath of trouble, unpleasing breath, can quickly mark you down. So be on your guard. Do this. Brush your teeth night and morning and before every date with Colgate Tooth Powder. For Colgate Tooth Powder cleans your breath as it cleans your teeth. Yes, scientific tests have definitely proved that in seven cases out of ten, Colgate Tooth Powder instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. What's more, no dentifrice at any price cleans your teeth more quickly and thoroughly than Colgate Tooth Powder. Remember to buy it first thing. And remember the name, Colgate Tooth Powder, with the accent on powder. Oh, Melvin. Yes, Uncle Rupert. Will you please sign this check? Well, what's it for? For $25. But, Uncle, we don't owe that much money to anybody. This is for the community chest drive. Oh, we owe them everything we can afford. Give me that pen. Good night, folks. <laughs> This is Buddy to remind you that Colgate Tooth Powder for Breath of Sweet and Teeth of Sparkle brings you the Mel Blank Show every Tuesday at this time. Be sure to join us again next Tuesday night for more fun with Mel and the people you'll meet in Mel Blank's Fix-It Shop. Say hello to Halo Shampoo for naturally bright and beautiful hair. Remember, even finest soaps and soap shampoos hide the natural luster of your hair with dulling soap film. But Halo Shampoo contains no soap, therefore leaves no dulling soap film. Even in hardest water, Halo makes oceans of rich, fragrant lather, quickly banishes loose dandruff and dirt. Halo needs no lemon or vinegar rinse. Say hello to Halo and goodbye to dulling soap film. Get Halo shampoo at any cosmetic counter. Remember, now by every new time This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. with Fred Allen. Texaco dealers from coast to coast present the Texaco Star Theater starring Fred Allen with Georgia Jessel, Broadway's new literary light, Hilo Jack and the Dane, Brooklyn Harper, the Texaco workshop players, Al Goodman, and his orchestra. And this is yours truly, Jimmy Wallington, reminding you that the metal and rubber that could have gone into new cars this spring are helping to beat the axis, and that your old car can help beat the axis, too, if you keep it in trim for your essential wartime driving with a Texaco dealer's regular care. So take your car to your neighborhood Texaco dealer tomorrow for a Texaco spring tonic. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a big week for travel. Winston Churchill went to Washington. Former Ambassador Joseph E. Davies went to Moscow. Tonight, we bring you a man who is going no place. And here he is, Fred up. Thank you, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy, you're right. This has been an eventful week. The RAF blew up those two big dams over in Germany. With all that water flooding Germany, Hitler will have to stop goose-stepping and start duck-stepping for a day. You know, people treading water in the streets over there will sink if they put their hands up. So now, when they hire Hitler with the other hand, they'll have to hold their noses. You know what I'm saying? You know, this sure has been a great week, Fred. 
Did you hear Mr. Churchill speak over the air last Wednesday? Yeah, I, I had to tune out our gal Sunday to hear him. <laughs> Mr. Churchill. Mr. Churchill says that Japan's cities will be laid in ashes. You know, does laid in ashes mean that the cities are going to be bombed? Or is Mr. Churchill going to fly over Japan with one of those big cigars? I don't know. <laughs> but things look good, Jimmy. We've taken Tunisia. We're bombing Italy. And don't forget that, too. What? That, too. Oh, just one touch, Jimmy. <laughs> but if things keep up this Mr. way... Mr. Of course. Portland, you look all tired out, if you don't mind my saying so. What's up? Well, I've been running around with Mama all week, trying to find potatoes. Trying to find potatoes. Potatoes. Yes, potatoes have been scarce, haven't they? The nearest I came to seeing a potato last week, I passed a man on the street smoking a spud cigarette. Man, <laughs> <laughs> the fun. How do you think oak trees grow up? Little acorns. That's the way laughs start. A person said it. <laughs> Mayor LaGuardia found 17,000 pounds of potatoes in a barber shop. Without his glasses, too. I saw that in the paper. I saw that in the paper. There was a sign in the barber shop window. It said, haircut and shave, 65 cents, with French fried potatoes, 10 cents. Did the mayor take the potatoes? I believe he did. Why? Well, the next time he goes to a fire, he can bake them. Yes, <laughs> It'll teach, it will teach the barber a lesson, too. No man should start in the potato business on a shoestring. Now, I hope the barber will take that to heart. After that joke... That's the last joke I'll buy in the black market. I'll do it. Down to Allen's Alley. Right. What is your question? Well, tomorrow, National Poetry Week starts, Portland, and during the week we are all supposed to be more or less poetry conscious, you see? And so our question tonight is what are you doing about National Poetry Week? Shall we go? After you, madam. <laughs> Here we are, back in Allen's Alley, Portland. Mr. Doe's cat is in the front yard. Oh, his cat? Well, if John has put the cat out, he must be going to bed. I'd better hurry up and nod. Oh, it's you again. Yes, Mr. Doe. Tell me, do you uh, do you observe National Poetry Week? Well, as a boy, my father wouldn't let me fool with no poetry. He was sore at all poets. Mad at all poets? Why? The complete works of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow once fell off a table and broke two of my father's toes. I see. And that's claiming against all poets. And are you <laughs> are you mad at poets too? Yeah, I don't like my father. So every year during National Poetry Week, I write a poem for Spike. For Spike, you write a poem. Well, what poem did you write this year for Spike? It's called the sixty-four dollar question. Well, how does it go? Guess what I am. I'll give you a quote. I'm not something old. I'm not something new. I've been cheered. I've been hissed, condemned, and approved. I've been lauded, I've been cursed, accepted, and removed. I've been esteemed, rejected, sanctioned, and banned, hailed again, welcomed, and finally canned. I ain't vegetable or mineral. I ain't woman or man. I'm just a football for Congress, the poor rumble player. <laughs> oh. Well, this looks like a great night for poetry, all right? Let's see what happens here next door. No. <laughs> ah, Mrs. Nussbaum. You are expecting maybe Mother McCree. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. Nussbaum, are you doing anything about National Poetry Week? Only once in my life I'm writing a poem. Only once? When? When I'm a little girl, Mumsy is sending me to a store I shall bring back for ten cents a salmon head. <laughs> I'm getting an inspiration. Oh, you bought the salmon head and you got an inspiration. What was your poem called? Solitude. Solitude. How did it <laughs> Solitude, how did it go? In a delicatessen on the floor stands a barrel by the door. In the barrel filled with brine floats a pickle saturnine. <laughs> Customers come in steady trickle. But no one buys the lonely pickle. <laughs> Bobbing, painting, floating, sinking. 
Little Pickle, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking if life could be a barrel of brine and man was a pickle green and fine. Man couldn't fight. Man would spread goodwill and the world would be getting a better bill, I think. <laughs> Mrs. Newsbound has a sour outlook. Perhaps we'll have better luck in here. <laughs> well, Socrates, how are you reacting to National Poetry Week? Oh, I've been writing poetry for years. You have, really? Yeah. What sort of poems do you write? Uh, mostly about water. Water poems? Yeah, if I see a lake, I'll write a poem. Oh, fine. If I see a brook, I'll write a poem. Good. If I see a bottle, I'll write well, we, uh, we, uh, we get the idea. <laughs> what, uh, what is your favorite water poem, Socrates? It's called... The, the sea. Uh, may we hear it tonight? Uh, sure. Thank uh, you. The, uh, this sea. What do I see when I look out the sea? I see the sea. What's the sea? Frigates and brigs, rowboats and rigs, catboats and launches, sailors with porches. Uh, that's what I see when I look out the sea. Well, thank you. Mackerel and pickerel. People see sickerel. Get them and flotch them. Well, as who caught them. That's what I see when I look at the sea. Thank you very much. That's another verse. Oh, another verse. Uh, I guess. No. What do I see when I look out the sea? What do I see? Well, what do you see? Nothing. The tide's out. <laughs> Once again, to a little poison ivy covered cottage at the end of the alley. Greetings, many gentlemen. Falstaff joins you once again. I hope you have come with uh, you have come sans dactyl tonight, Falstaff. Oh, come, sir. Have you heard rabbits aren't babbits, but they do have babbit habits? No. Or uh, said the big bull whale to the little sardine, "Brother, I've been necking a submarine." <laughs> Sounds familiar. I heard it with a minnow once, I think, in a rowboat. I'm not sure. Have you heard this? Mother put arsenic on the cinnamon toast. A few minutes later, father gave up the ghost. Now we are. You have finally done it. Tonight we are discussing poetry here. Why else would I be here? I have done it again. What is your poem called? The Muse Has Come to the Alley. Carry on, sir. This evening, National Poetry Week was observed in Allen's Alley. You've heard assorted rhyme and quip and rondelay and sally. John Doe regaled you with refrain on the rummel plan's decline. Mrs. Nussbaum's ode to the gherkin praised the pickle saturnine. Socrates look out to sea, and the ocean did malign. These double crosses have ruined my racket. They've left me naught to recite. So I'll fold my tent like the Arab and steal back into the night. Well, thank you, sir. Slinks out of our lives. We know it is Hilo Jack and the Dame Time. It is also Al Goodman Time. With talents proved, they bring you Wait for Me, Mary. Wait for me, Mary. Tell the world to fall again. Tell the clouds to fall again. And the dreams to fall again. Wait for me, Mary. Wait for me, Mary. Till 
along with each and every copy of Mr. Jessel's book, I'm throwing in a little dandy best pocket orange juice squeezer and a Boy Scout jackknife with 347. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You that ain't enough? All right. With each and every copy of Mr. Jessel's book, I give you the author himself. And here he is. Meet Mr. George Jessel. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, gosh, Georgie, make a personal appearance with every book. You'll be here. <laughs> Georgie, I can't believe it. Here you are, the great literary... <laughs> here you are, the great literary lion, and only last week you were just plain Jessel the actor. Yes, Fred, my pantaloon days are over. The grease plate on my collar has given away to ink stains on my fingertips. You know, with that monocle in your eye, you even look like an author there for a minute. Is that so? And I'm letting my hair grow long, too. And with me, this is not so easy. <laughs> you certainly changed, Georgie. I don't see you eating in Lindy's anymore. Oh, no, Fred. There's no chopped liver on my breath these days. Oh, no. <laughs> Smell. Mmm. What is that? Tea. Tea? Orange Pico. I go to a little tea shop downtown. The Fawn's Haunt, they call it. The Fawn's Haunt. Yes, huh? the intelligentsia eater, you know. It's a real literary rendezvous. Oh, right? yes. Last year, the menu won the Pulitzer Prize. And of course, in a place like that, if it just makes a grammatical error while ordering, the bouncer comes and whoop, he's out right away. Oh, yes. That's the circle you are moving That's in. That's the people I hang around well, with. Well, tell me, did you move out of that actor's hotel on 4060? Well, of course, to get the real writer's atmosphere. I'm living now in an attic down in Greenwich Village. You're living in a garret? Mm-hmm. The same room that John Steinberg wrote Mice and Men. The same room. And the same mice are there. <laughs> Well, Georgie, after your exciting career in the theater, isn't this literary life a letdown? Letdown? Why, first, since my book So Healthy came out, every morning I'm in Fontana's window blowing kisses to the crowds and autographing, you know. How, every morning? How long does this keep up? Till noon, then I run over to the automat. Oh, to the automat? Yes. You sell your book in the automat? Right next to the potato salad, yes. <laughs> so you put a dime in the slot, my head flies out, and I read you a chapter of the book, you see? <laughs> Well, that keeps you pretty busy. And on top of this, they've asked me to join the Book of the Month Club, but I refuse. Why? Who can write a book every month? Well, I... <laughs> you, uh, well, tell me, Georgie, how did you come to write the story of your life? Well, but one day I went down to the draft board. Yes? And then suggested, well, how did you get to look like this in only 37 years? <laughs> so this sort of... <laughs> sort of set me to thinking. That's your thinking, huh? Yes, I started conjuring up my early days. My grandfather with the long beard. He had a long beard? Oh, my God. had the longest beard in the Bronx, my grandfather, yes. <laughs> he had buckles down the front and a belt in the back. <laughs> part of a zoot beard. Yes. <laughs> Gosh. Then I thought of my Uncle Louie, the Sturgeon King. You know, Uncle Louie, you like that. The Uncle Louie was crazy, you know. Really? Yes. My Uncle Louie thought he was a piece of boiled beef. We had to go in every hour and pour horseradish on his head. It was awful. Awesome. <laughs> then you had some interesting relatives. And then, Fred, I thought about my father. Every day my father would sit on the front steps in his bathrobe wearing a fez. That's all he did for a living, wear a fez? Well, yeah. no, no. At night, my father would put on his dress suit and his high silk hat. Then I'd run after him down the street, laughing all the time. Laughing at your own father? Yeah, you see, his shirt front used to light up and spell Fugleman's Romanian restaurant. <laughs> My father had a very big chest. There was room for everything. Yeah. Well, you must have had some pleasant memories. Fred, when I emptied the top drawer of my mind, well, I had a book. I should hope so. You know, I'm going to write the story of my life, George. Now, if I can only get a successful writer to well, help I'm me... Well, I'm a successful writer, Fred. You should read what the critics have said about my book. The critics? Well, well I have the notices right here. Look at this. Hoboken and Herald. Jessel is a shining light in the literary horizon. Hoboken. We Hawk and Gazette. Dynamite in every page. Look at this, Staten Island Chronicle, a must on your reading list. Look at here, the New York Daily News. Eh, who reads the news? <laughs> well, the critics, that, uh, they, they had to read your book, Georgie. That's their business. Who else is... Everybody is reading my book first. Oh, now, don't overdo it. Oh, no. no. Well, well, all right, you've got a thousand people here in your audience right in the studio. Ask any one of these people. Oh, that's ridiculous. Is this allowed? Pick any one at random. Now, that lady over there, there, for the thing in the third row. Oh, lady and madam, there. would you step up here, please? Would you mind... Now, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Georgie. We can't interrupt the radio broadcast. Radio, radio. I want to prove something to you, and it'll be all right. 
Madam, would you mind standing over here? Uh, my name is uh, Alan, uh, madam. This is Mr. Jessel. I'm glad to meet you both. Oh, thank you. Now, madam, I'd like to ask you one question. Have you read a book called So Help Me, uh, written by George Jessel? Oh, so Help Me? Well, now, if you haven't read it, I mean, never mind, because Miss Alan, I just want to prove something. You're... I have read the book. You have? There you are, Fred. An absolute stranger picked a friend. This lady has read my book. Thank you, madam. Now, I'm more... Just a minute, madam. Yes, Mr. Allen. Uh, madam, what do you think of the book? I think it's the greatest book I ever read. And I think Mr. Jessel's name will go down in history as one of the greatest country's geniuses. Mrs. I don't know what to say to you, but I'm deeply indebted to you for that statement. Allow me to help you right back now, to your just, just a minute, madam. May I have your name for our files, please? I'm Mrs. Jessel. Jessel, are you... Uh... <laughs> By any chance related to this gentleman here? I'm his mother. I thought so. His mother. <laughs> what a coincidence! A thing like this couldn't happen to in a thousand years, such a thing. Yeah, You've been as far as you're fine, mother. Yes, I'll see you home later. Go ahead. Go ahead. Don't come home to Don't worry about me. I'll send the money. Take her out. Take her out. <laughs> She won't take it from me. Now, look, uh, everything is all fun. Let's get going. Now, I want to write the story of your life. Well, all right. I think I can trust you, Georgie. Before we start, how much will you charge to ghostwrite my book? Well, to write like a ghost, I'll have to wear a clean sheet every day. This runs into money, you know. <laughs> what, uh, what is your usual fee? Well, for a thousand dollars, I can write your life in ten volumes. And with this, I'll go in two bookends. For a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. Well, haven't you something cheaper? Well, now, for $500, I can squeeze your life into one book. One book. In one volume. But then you're not as big a man as you are in ten volumes. Well, no. But it'll be a nice, fat book. Babies can sit on it. It'll save a high chair if you need it. (laughs) Georgie, what do you write for, say, a hundred? Oh, a hundred dollars. This comes out of very small pamphlet. Pamphlet. I write a few dates. You were born, and two pages later, you're already an old man. That's all. In two pages? Well, for this price, you age very quickly, you know. I don't know. A hundred dollars is a lot for a pamphlet. What would I get for, say, fifty dollars? For fifty dollars, you will get a hand bill with your picture on it. <laughs> Underneath our right here is a man with something on the ball. <laughs> <laughs> and for you, I'll throw in a picture of the ball besides. Is that all right? Dorothy, I'm afraid that... Oh, you want it cheaper. All right. Four dollars. I'll write your name on Kleenex. You no. sound fine? <laughs> Georgie, look, forget, forget about my life. Forget the whole thing. And if I were you, I'd even forget about writing. What do you mean? My book is a big success. I'll make a fortune. Look, you can't make any money writing a book, Joe. Well, why not? Look, I'll explain the whole thing to you. If, in the first place, if your book is a bestseller, in two weeks it comes out in a 25-cent edition and they start selling it around in the drugstores, you see? A customer comes in, picks up your book, reads it while he eats his meal at the soda fountain, then puts the book back on the rack. Mm. The party not only reads your book for nothing, but he still malted milk on it and the pages stick together so you can't even sell it later. That's true. I've done it myself with the fudge sundae. That's it's true. It's sweeter with, with the fudge sundae. But give up writing. <laughs> give up writing, Georgie. You'll end up like Shakespeare alone in a garret drumming a crumpet. Come back to the theater. Remember those good old days in Paulville? Remember the time we played the Hippodrome, the big house in Red Bank? Oh, you remember who was on the bill? Pinkus's performing peacock. Pinkus's um, peacock. Yes, I remember, remember how Pinkus would shake the peacock every morning and should lay an egg for Pinkus' breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> the peacock's eggs uh, had technicolor yolks, as I remember. Yes, I do, yes. And the great Saul Peter, the great type wire was. Oh, remember uh, the night the great Saul Peter broke his leg, the wire was loose, and the great Saul Peter was tight. Yes. yes. <laughs> Those were the days. Ah, come back, back, Georgie. The name Jessel in front of a theater in blue neon will pack them in. Yeah, I know. But the name of Jessel now belongs to the world of literature. Well, look, you can take another name for the theater. Start a new career. Think up a name, any name. A new name? Right. Now, wait a minute. How would a name like maybe uh, Jolson be? Jolson? That's an odd name. Yeah, yeah. that's an odd name. I just made that up. That name. Yeah. Yeah. I'll call myself Mal. Like Al Smith, only there's an M on it. Mal Jolson. Let's see how that sounds. Tonight we launch a new star, Mal Jolson. Mal Jolson. Now, name like that might catch on. Mal Jolson. It's possible. With a few jokes and a song, uh, you can't miss Mal. Well, I got a song for you. Fine. Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to present the world premiere of a new personality, Mal Jolson. Now, listen. You ain't hiding nothing yet. Play it, Gilman. I lost. 
broke my heart in Avalon. I thought they really take that beat away. I left my love in Avalon and sailed away. I dream of her and Avalon from dusk till dawn. And so I think I'll travel on to Before we close the Texas Go Star Theater, I want to thank Mal Jolson and Georgie Jessel for dropping in tonight. Next week, we bring you Dr. Rockwell, Maine's ambassador of goodwill, in his only radio appearance this season. And here's Jimmy Wallington with a poppy in his lapel and a message from all Texaco dealers. Yes, Fred, Texaco dealers ask you to remember that buying a poppy is a way we can help needy veterans, their families, and the families of men now in service. So buy a poppy and wear it as a tribute to America's fighting men. An excellent suggestion, Jimmy. This is Fred Allen speaking for Texaco dealers from coast to coast, inviting you to tune in again next Sunday and to drive in at any time. Remember, you're welcome. Thank you. Good night.